for those of you watching at home. You can now tell that I'm not uh, Ann Watson. <laughs> First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Are there any uh, changes anyone wants to make to the agenda? Uh, Mr. President, uh, if we could move item 16 to the end of the meeting, it doesn't need to occur where it, where it is listed. Okay. That's a potential uh, executive session, so sounds good. Anything else? Yes. Just the only thing I had noticed, it says design review board appointments. I think it's the design review committee. So just to clarify that for everybody. Uh, good point, thank you. Okay, hearing no objection or other suggestions, so deem the uh, agenda approved. Next on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any person to uh, either physically present or online to uh, make a statement about any item that's not on the agenda. I see we have a good turnout, probably mostly talking about the budget item or ballot items. And so you will have the opportunity to see that. But uh, if there are people who want to <coughs> be heard about any other item, now is the opportunity. And uh, I think I will uh, take people in the room first. So Stephen, and as always, we ask people to hold your comments to roughly two minutes. Which I don't think there's any basis for in law. I think that it's been an arbitrary uh, way to cut off people who have done deeper research than the counselors in many cases. Um, on the way into the building, I just uh, watched the Greyhound bus pass two people who were standing in dark clothes with their suitcases. Um, and I am reminded that uh, Greyhound started service here up again months ago, and we built a transit center years ago. And it's another example of absolute dysfunction that we haven't arranged with Greyhound to use our transit center. These people had to walk all the way down to Kinney Drugs and cross frozen ice patches of sidewalk to get their bags to the bus. Luckily, I went and flagged the bus and made sure he stayed blocking traffic on the through lane of Main Street, you know? But it's just an example of how uh, dysfunctional our city mismanagement is. Uh, public records, again, I'm not gonna let you hear the end of it until you produce the records. I have filed an appeal to the head of the agency regarding the police records related to the radio system and the body cameras. And city manager, Ms. Manager re responded, but he refuses to comply with statute. Statute requires you either produce the records or certify that the records are not available and or, and you also notify someone of their right of appeal to the court. Uh, despite our manager making more than a lawyer would, that would ensure that city council and the city staff uh, adhere to public records law, refuses to comply with public records law. Similarly, there's a body cam, and I'll bring this up in the budget. There's a record, there's a proposal for body cams that was supplied by the company, the major leading company of the equipment that Berlin uses called Axon, and they're hiding it. They're, they either destroyed it or they're hiding it, but an Axon representative told me they did supply a quote for Montpelier and the quote included, I told him it was a problem to include tasers because we've had that battle. They need separate quotes. But my point is when they are asked for a specific record and refuse to provide a specific record, it turns from ineptness to corruption, right? You're, they're being asked for, they're asking for money. The budget says that there's money in there for body cams. They have not done their due diligence and they haven't done due diligence on radios. They haven't done due, due diligence on cameras and y'all are not asking the right questions. And you're in effect condoning the city manager violating public records law and continuing to sweep these records under the rug. <laughs> it's atrocious and you really need to do your jobs. Okay, thank you. Anybody else in the room who wants to be heard? 
Councillor Bate. We'll stand up here. <laughs> Um, I want to announce that I'm rerunning. I'm running for re-election to represent District One as City Councilor, and I want to express my great appreciation for all my fellow council members and staff, Bill and Cameron, and many, many others who support us as we read so much material and hear so much expertise that, that we really respect one another, and that's very helpful. And I just want the public to know that when we come together. We're hearing one another's opinion most of the time for the first time. And it's really important that they understand that we need to talk to one another. Yes, we need to hear from our public, but we need to talk to one another. And that the public by all means can talk, but they also can email us, call us, many do, and that's great. But we also need our discussions. So I appreciate that you all come prepared to have those discussions. And I just wanna say it took a lot of courage to make the cuts we did immediately in the response to the pandemic in 2020, cut budgets 21, 22. And this year we had an opportunity to put things back. And yes, it is an increase, but in proportion, it's not over time that big of an increase. And particularly for our infrastructure. We know people have trouble with our roads and we can't do that without the bonds. We can't do that without the staffing. So it's really, really important that I hope that people can see the whole picture and I think for me, I really try to look at the whole picture. It's like economic development. I may not vote to put $100,000 in the budget for it, because I think first we have to have the housing. We have to put attention on our downtown and our bike paths and walkability, our parks, and then we'll have economic development. So I sort of come in from a different doorway in the way I vote and support things. So it's hard to do a campaign that says, I support economic development. I do, but mostly backfill that then makes economic development happen. So anyway, I support, support, I seek your vote from people in District 1 and also that people call me. And when you call a council person, yes, it's great to call the district person that represents you, but call all of us because you may have a piece of information, a perspective that somebody else doesn't have. So thank you for your support in the past. and. I'm done. Thank you. Councillor Casey. All right, I don't have a speech prepared, but uh, <laughs> Councillor Bates, a tough act to follow. Uh, but I, I thought I'd join her in also announcing my re-election for District 2 for Council. It's, um, it, it's really, the last two terms have been a great honor, um, just serving with all of you and, and serving this community. It's. Uh, uh, amazing the conversations you have, you know, not only here in City Hall, but, you know, when you're buying arugula in the, uh, in the supermarket, it's um, so, such a dedicated, dedicated community who really cares about each other. And I think that's been shown more than ever during the most difficult times with this, pan this, this pandemic. Um, you know, the first term, there was a lot of ribbon cuttings and everything. It's, it's gotten a lot harder since, and we've really had to make some decisions that have a real and immediate impact on people's lives. And I, I think we all take those very seriously. Um, and I, there's miles to go. I, I'm proud of what we've accomplished. Um, I, I'm proud of really the compassion of my colleagues here and the city staff in trying to make sure we, we care for our most vulnerable in the city. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do as well. So um, yeah, I'm eager to have a conversation with folks. I'll uh, release a statement next week, um, but just wanted to put it on the record I'm running. and. Uh, would really appreciate anybody's support. So thanks so much. Thank you. Um, anybody else in the room who wants to make a statement? Yes, Councillor Morton. Hi, I'm short. I'm going to stand like this. Um, I also would like to um, announce that I am an officially putting myself out there to run for um, District 3 seat. This has been a really fast learning curve, and I feel like I'm just starting to really feel super invested in this position and my community, well, I'm already invested in my community, but doing this kind of work, stepping out in front of all of my neighbors and um, trying to make a difference and showing my kids that you don't have to, you know, have a college degree to 
help your community. Sorry, I'm getting really choked up right now. I didn't think I would. Anyways, um, I will write an official um, announcement, but I just wanted to follow my colleagues here and um, thank the community that got me here in the first place. Miigwech. Great, thank you. Um, I see some hands raised on, uh, on Zoom, Jake Brown. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor McCullough. <clears throat> um, just a quick note, I'm, I'm chair of the Cemetery Commission, some of you may know, and I uh, just wanted to put it out there. We have a seat available uh, to fulfill a two-year remaining term on the commission. Uh, so uh, getting the word out and um, anybody in the assembled group uh, can pass the word out to, to their friends and family, relatives, whomever. Um, but um, we're a good group and uh, we meet once a month and um, you can find information. You can just probably the best thing to do is just to contact me or Patrick Healy. I'm at jakebrown2301 at gmail.com. Patrick Healy, the cemetery director, cemetery at montpelier-vt.org uh, for information about, um, about uh, running. Uh, so just wanted to get that out there. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you. And sorry, Justin, I realized that you were first in line, Justin Dressler. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. How are you doing? Um, so I want to talk about something that is related to the budget in an ancillary way. So a lot of you know that the that Vermont is resettling a number of uh, Afghan families who have either refugee or humanitarian parolee status. And it appears for either the first time or maybe um, for the most aggressive time, uh, some of them are being resettled in Montpelier. And we actually already have four families that have resettled in Montpelier. Not all of them have full-time housing. And this is a very exciting um, time for me. It's a very exciting time for the families. I think it should be a very exciting time for the city. Uh, but one thing that I want to make sure doesn't get lost is the city oftentimes talks about diversity and equity and really um, caring for communities and caring for our community and caring for others and really being welcoming. But oftentimes it is just talk and we don't really have an opportunity to act on it. I do think in this instance with these families, we do have an opportunity to act by creating some sort of humanitarian earmark in our budget. Uh, my understanding is that the budget is somewhat fungible. So it's not as if we have to say, it, X is gonna go to this family and X is gonna go to Y family, et cetera. My understanding is also that these families are going to have access to a number of different resources. For example, the Vermont Emergency Rent Assistance Program, which just started, they should have access to. We don't know for certain yet. There are a number of other programs and financial assistance that they're going to have access to. But it is likely, in fact, probably inevitable, that there are going to be need, need to be gaps. There are gaps that are going to need to be filled in. And I think that it should be the city's responsibility to fill in those gaps. Um, for many years, we have asked uh, for, for more diversity in our town. We have attempted to bring more diversity into our town. We have finally been successful, and I really think we need to welcome these families with open arms. I also don't think these will be the last families that are resettled in Montpelier. Uh, I think it's everyone's hope to eventually build an entire community here uh, where people can feel welcome. And so I would just ask that during your budget discussions, you would just be mindful of this, that there might be these gaps. And I know there are many things in Montpelier that are imperfect. It's a wonderful town to live in. We have an unhoused problem that you are all constantly dealing with. Um, but um, when you're talking about uprooting a family that's been displaced because of the actions of the United States directly, um, I do think that we all have a responsibility to those individuals particularly those who are the most vulnerable and have challenges reading, writing, et cetera. And I will just, um, I will end with this, which is that I, I had intended initially to introduce some of the family members on this, uh, at this meeting or to even bring them to the city council meeting, but there's still a number of privacy and safety concerns related to all of them. And so that's not something that we're going to do right now. Um, so again, I just think you should be mindful in general uh, about humanitarian aid, about some sort of humanitarian fund in Montpelier, because you really do need to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Justin. I think it's great that we're doing this. Okay.
anyone else who would like to be heard who's not been heard? I'm not seeing any any hands. Yes, Bill. Just just briefly for the record, the city never did never received a proposal from Axon at any time, so there was no record. It was in a presentation that Axon made to the city council. It was on a screen. If you may recall, they they came in remotely. Uh, so it was never transmitted to us. There were some brochures that were turned over. And uh, for clarity's sake, we have money in the budget for uh, body cameras, but we have not made any selection. When, yeah, assuming the budget is proposed, is so approved, there will be a, um, a process by which we put them out to bid and review them and, and make a purchase. So no decisions about the types of cameras have been made. Thank you. Okay, on to the uh, consent agenda. Is there anyone who wants to move anything off the consent agenda? Okay, is there a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda. Second. There's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now we have a uh, a long series of appointments for the ADA Committee, Complete Streets Committee, Conservation Commission, and the Design Review Committee. So I suggest we take all of those up, give everyone the who's applied the opportunity to, to address the council, and then we may have the motion to go into executive session. So is there anyone here in the room who's applied to be on any of these committees? I don't think so. Is there anyone uh, watching on, on Zoom who uh, has applied who would like to be heard on any of the uh, committee uh, appointments? And just raise your hand on the, on the Zoom app if you are. Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands raised, and I'm not seeing any names that match with the uh, with the applications. So I think we can uh, move forward. Yes, uh, Donna. I did have a question about one application that maybe staff could tell me uh, on the one for the Conservation Commission, Rose. Um, within her application, the answers don't match the questions. And so I believe perhaps she's a resident of Plainfield instead of she says yes to being a resident to Montpelier, but then the next, which should, which should be a no yes question, is the word Plainfield. Do you know by chance? Does anybody know Rose? Okay. Don't know, and just looking. Um... Yeah, I see what you mean. I. I... That struck me too. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand. Oh, is that you? Phyllis Rubenstein. Oh, okay. So um, I am a little bit familiar with this issue since I am on the Montpelier Conservation Commission and I was aware that Rose was applying and that she's a resident of Plainfield. When this came up, we did, um, one of our members um, asked someone from City Hall, and we were told that you don't that a uh, member of the commission does not have to be a resident of, of Montpelier. Yeah, I was going to respond to that. There is no, uh, and I believe I either answered it directly or gave the answer to someone else to answer. Um, so there's no law or requirement that members of these commissions be city residents. Um, typically, the council has given preference to city reference residents and for some uh, comm commissions or committees with more you know like the drb the drc with real decision making or um, they've really insisted on that they've held the line on that on others for example design review and others over the years there have been some non-residents usually somebody who has a connection to the community somehow or a specific expertise or whatever so it's completely at the council's discretion who you appoint but there is not a hard and fast rule on that okay thank you 
Yeah, I know from, uh, I think we've had people on the uh, ADA committee who've not been members too, in my experience. I see Am Amelia Seaman. Hi there. Um, I'm I'm Rose Zader, so I'm the one that you guys are talking about. I'm just watching it from Amelia's phone. She's my fiance. <laughs> um, I am currently living in Plainfield, but um, I'm buying a house and going to be a resident of Montpelier beginning February 1st. So I was told that that was okay. So um, that's the situation, I guess, just to clarify. Great, thank you. Does anyone have any other questions for Rose? Donna. Uh, I just want Rose and uh, Phyllis who answered that I had no question about her being able to serve if she was from Plainfield. It was just where that Plainfield ended in her form was not the right line. So I wanted to make sure that's what it meant. That's all. So thank you for clarifying. We welcome your offer. Okay. Is there a motion? It's the motion that I would typically make to go into executives. <laughs> Spoon feed it to us, Jack. I make a motion that we go into it. Yes, I've lost that. It's not, I didn't does someone it. want to make a motion to go into executive session? Oh, there you there go. You go. Um, I move we enter executive session to discuss uh, an appointment um, or a series of appointments. Um, Two city committees pursuant to one VSA 313A4. Three. Three. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we'll go into executive session. We'll be back shortly. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, now we're back in public se session. Is there a motion? Uh, um, yes, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the following people to the committees that we discussed in executive session. Um, the uh, number five, the ADA committee appointment, Deanna James and Margaret Fernan, um, Complete Streets Committee appointment, David Ori, um, Conservation Commission, Rose, come on, Donna, Luzadin and Benjamin Block, and the Design Review Board appointment, Martha Smirsky and Sis Pritchett. Elizabeth Pritchett. Liz Pritchett. Liz Pritchett. Liz Pritchett, thank you. Sorry. And second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Jack? Just just clarifying, it's the design review committee, not the design review yes. board. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, congratulations and thank you to everyone who has uh, volunteered to apply. I'm always impressed by the high quality of the uh, people who come out and uh, and volunteer their time for the various boards and commissions we have. Um, next up, we have uh, item nine, the community fund awards. Um, Mr. Chair, while while Amy is getting ready for her presentation, I just note that the projected awards are actually three thousand dollars over the budget. Um, so uh, we, we had 131,000 and they're at 134,000. Um, I don't think it's a huge problem, but so your choices, of course, are you can either increase the budget, you can ask us to find it, or you can ask them to go back and cut 3,000 from their recommendations. Um, but just so everyone's aware of this, the circumstance going in, but otherwise they're pretty close. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> and now Amy Cunningham, you are on. Hi, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I was not aware of, aware of that discrepancy, discrepancy, so I really appreciate it. Is it possible, I just have a few short slides um, and I see I'm not able to, to share screen. What's the best way to, uh, to should, do that? You should be able to do it now. 
We just got a Adam. thumbs up from the assistant city manager. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Great. You all able to see that? Yep. Great, thank you. Um, so thanks for your time. Uh, this is our annual presentation to the city council uh, with our recommendations for uh, funding support through the Montpelier Community Fund. I am Amy Cunningham. This is my fourth or fifth year uh, serving on the Community Fund Board. This is my first year as chair and uh, really pleased to be joined. I believe all of my fellow uh, uh, fund board members are here tonight. Mairead Harris, Shana Casper, Christopher Kaufman Ilstrip, and Michael Sherman. So uh, shout out to them for all of the work and wisdom they've provided through this process. Uh, briefly, this is a blurry image, but uh, this is the best visual representation for why the Montpelier Community Fund is uh, was created. This is a ballot, a picture of the ballot from 2009. And many of you may remember um, many different items on the ballot that were difficult for uh, voters to assess and were challenging for the particular organizations requesting support to make their case. Uh, and so uh, the city council created the Montpelier Community Fund in 2012. Uh, we're a five member board appointed by you. The criteria for our decisions uh, as outlined by city council are the extent to which the grant will benefit Montpelier, its residents and the public good by effectively addressing basic human needs or enhancing the quality, vitality and sustainability of life in Montpelier. Uh, and part of the, um, the genius of the system you all set up with the community fund is that uh, nonprofits have two choices. They may, they are prohibited from petitioning to be on the ballot if they apply to the Montpelier Community Fund. Uh, and so our application uh, is, is easier in many ways than uh, the, the uh, gathering the signatures required to be on the ballot. Uh, and so we have, you've established the Montpelier Community Fund to read 35 or 45, uh, 35 to 45 applications instead of there being 35 to 45 articles on the ballot uh, consisting of funding requests. Uh, just briefly, our review process this year, very similar to past years, we gather together to review and revise application and guidelines, making changes based on what we learned from the previous year's process with an eye towards keeping things as simple and clear as possible for our applicants. Uh, we release and do outreach to potential applicants. Uh, this year, we added a, a public open house for applicants. We created a, a, a direct email account uh, for applicants to reach out to us for questions and created a FAQs document. Uh, all of that is available on the Montpelier Community Fund uh, webpage. Um, uh, that uh, shout out to uh, Mary for all of her help in, in getting those, those uh, materials up uh, for folks to, to, to uh, review. Uh, so we re read board members uh, come together. Every board member reads every application with applications ranging from 10 to 20 pages. And we take a half day meeting in December uh, to assess and make the final decisions. And so we report to you tonight with this final slate of recommendations. Um, and in a nutshell, uh, we're requesting uh, $134,090 uh, in funding represents uh, 36 grants. We've done a rough breakout here of the different categories. As you probably well know, many of these nonprofit organizations overlap in their mission. Uh, so some of these, these categories uh, overlap a bit, but in general, uh, the bulk of the funding goes to human services, uh, followed by arts and humanities, cultural organizations, and environmental organizations. Again, it's 36 grants this year. You can see the full list in the meeting uh, packet. As compared to last year, very similar. Um, there were 38 requests. Last year, we recommended 34 grants. This year, there are 36 requests and we are recommending funding for each of those requests. Uh, but you'll see we're re recommending um, about $40,000 less in, in funding, which means there's partial grants we're recommending to some of these 36 grantees. So that in a nutshell is what we're proposing. Like I said, the, in, your, in the packet is the full list of the applicants and we'd be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions from any members of the council? Donna. Uh, thank you, not only for your good work, but you always do a great presentation. 
Um, I always pause when I'm looking at these larger ones, 10,000, 15,000, and some of them are more statewide. And I know you look at the data, so you know how much they're impacting directly, indirectly, Montpelier. But if we were to ask you to go back, I guess I'm feeling the need to reduce some of those higher ones. Is that, would that be your inclination or would you have another way of sorting out if we ask for a reduction? That's a great question. So speaking for myself, I'd obviously I want to get the input of the full board. Uh, I think we certainly could approach some of those larger grants. I would say, uh, as you pointed out, we do really pay close attention and ask them a lot of specific questions about their impact and their services in Montpelier in particular. Uh, and so I would, those larger grants are in part a reflection of uh, the scale of work and impact um, that we see that they're having uh, for the city. Um, so I, I couldn't say for sure uh, if that's where we would um, recommend the cuts, but we'd certainly take your recommendation into consideration if we need to go back and reconsider. It's just that all but one of the ones you've increased are over 10,000. So that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? And again, are there, oh, no? Okay, Lauren. Well, I guess just to where Bill started, I mean, is finding $3,000 or what was the discrepancy? Three. Could you describe that? And, and I mean, is that something you think is well, we're, you know, I think feasible or should we I, be it is feasible. Out I mean, we're doing the budget for next year, which this would be in. So it's, I think it's, I, I don't believe it's necessary to ask them to go reduce, you know, some the amounts to these awards. I just, we should be aware that if by approving this, our budget has 131,000 in it. So, and this is 134. So we can, you, Right, we can make an adjustment somewhere in the budget as we finalize it in the next couple of weeks, or we can just add 3,000 to this line. But uh, in either, either case, it's not a huge change in, in the overall scheme of things. I just wanted to be clear that I'm not recommending you ask them to cut. Okay. Uh, Connor. Hey, Amy. Uh, any idea why Washington County Youth Service Bureau didn't apply? I'm just thinking like they provide such an important function, you know, especially during COVID with like after school programs, that type of thing. So just uh, that seemed like a big gap there. Yes, you're absolutely right. That was the biggest previous applicant that we didn't see come back to the to the table this year. So I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I have the same question. Thanks. Any other council members? Okay, members of the public, uh, Vicki Lane, I see you've got your hand up. Yes, I do. Um, I, uh, I don't think um, that any cuts to these uh, should be uh, entertained until or unless you're willing to entertain other cuts in other places in the budget. Um, I am concerned about the Washington County Youth Services Bureau not being there. I would hope that maybe we could find out why they're not there and maybe they don't, maybe they have other funding they can use. So anyway, um, I, I can't entertain cuts to these particular organizations. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Jennifer. I just wanted to um, say that um, the Youth Service Bureau is no longer in Montpelier. I think they might be in Berlin right now. They moved their offices, so I don't know if that would have anything to do with it, but they are no longer on Elm Street, but the basement center obviously is still here. Okay. Okay, so there we are. Any, any other discussion on the, Steve? Yeah, I, Steve Whitaker, I, I want to point out that I made an effort to download the packet today. The, the city council meeting is in the website calendar three different times. You can't download an agenda from one of them. You can't get to the documents. It's a real, uh, the, the inability to have reviewed this stuff ahead of time, not that 
they're not all worthy causes. But I also want to reiterate when when you delegate one hundred and thirty one thousand dollars of public money to these organizations, in this case, it's twice removed. It goes to the the found you know the this group and then approved by the council and the accountability, the recourse, the transparency is missing. You know, that's that's why in effect, these are government functions to some degree that we're using public money for, but we're forfeiting the transparency and the accountability that comes with public records law. And that we really need to give some serious thought to how we uh, inform or re-engage in these contracts, in these grant agreements. But we also need to fix the website because it's a real impediment. Okay, so what's your pleasure at this point? Is there a motion with regard to this uh, item? Because at this point, we could have a motion to add this to the uh, to the budget. Just to approve the recommendation. Yeah. You deal with the budget number when we get to the budget. Yep. Lauren. Um, I move we approve the budget recommendation from the Vermont Community Foundation. I'll second. Okay, is there any uh, any discussion beyond what we've already had? Donna. Well, I'm I'm still feeling uneasy with all the these large ones that got the increases were the largest to begin with, and then they all got increases. So I I would rather they go back and go back to what we budgeted, and maybe we weren't clear with them what we budgeted. Um, but I'm not I don't support it as it is. That's okay, fine. and I think you're right that it wasn't communicated. What we budgeted because I don't think I don't think the uh, timelines line up. So I don't think <clears throat> that the draft budget is with the committee when they uh, when they get take the applications in. Was our number the same same as we had last year? I'd have to check. I mean, I think that's general. There is communication between us and them, and we usually, you know, I think we told them okay. plan on the same numbers last year. The, the total that um, Amy has, Amy, maybe I can ask you, your total here for FY22 was 135000 Was that also then what we gave? Last year, the, so the FY22 budget that we're in now was 131050 and that's what we have in FY23. Obviously, okay. the council approved 135000 last year. Um, and so perhaps... You know, I could understand confusion if we'd said same amount as last year, and they believed okay. 35 was the amount. Okay. okay. Well, we'll work on that. No, I, I can put this number in better context, having looked at the total for FY22. Again, wonderful data. Amy, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Thomas Moore. Um, is this committee now, Bill, um, all this stuff that were lined items like the library to the bus company is it is this what this is all about so it doesn't Where, include the library the library will, it does not include the library the library will still be on the ballot the bus uh, uh transit is in the city budget so it's not so but yes all this other social service agencies that used to be on the ballot the right <clears throat> for the blind and the so, people's health and wellness and those sorts of things so when we used to vote separately yes or no for this organization yes. or that one so now is it going to be either yes or no and then if it's a yes and there's a few no, uh, you won't be voting on this at all so so a number of years this isn't new uh we've probably been doing this now for eight Five. eight years or so more or more where the city council puts a certain amount of money in the budget and we appoint this uh, community fund board to take applications and recommend grant awards and then the council approves those grant awards so that we don't have to do all that voting so this is this is not a this has actually been around for quite a while now right but what if there was something i approve and then there was other things i don't feel you know well, I, you know, I, I, I understand. What I'm trying to say is, you know, if, if I'm saying no to some, they're going to get it. 
If it's a yes yeah, vote. But you won't be voting on this at all, uh, other than the whole city budget. They're, they're part of the whole city budget. Okay. And that's and that has that is not. I, I'm just trying to tell you, Tom. This hasn't. Been, this isn't a new practice. This okay. has happened for probably at least eight years. All right. It's, you yeah. know, there are some things on the items yeah, I approve I of. Mm -hmm. You know, now you know, and then there was a few I didn't care for. Yep. And it's like the whole. It's like that for the whole budget too. You could, you could like the roads, like the fire department, like the police. Oh yeah, like you know, I could vote yes for an increase for Bob and then no to streets. <laughs> but you know, I thought it was all combined into one. Right. It exactly. is. Huh? It is all. Everything's in one. Okay. So yeah, if it passes, this. if it passes and. I didn't want money to the roads. It's going to it anyhow. Yep, and that's been so. I don't get to. Every voter doesn't get to vote on every single item. Correct. We never have. I thought that yeah. When you go down, it would be say, do you approve for the library? Do you approve for the library, senior center? Do you the, approve this much for? Yeah, the, the, teen the center. Huh? Yeah. So the library is still a separate ballot item. And the, and there's a couple separate ballot items, but the teen center and all those things have not been separate ballot items for a long time. At least ten years. It's been a I long don't know, time. I don't vote, and I don't. I didn't. Uh. Okay, Donna. Well, I I would want to reassure you, Tom. One of the ways, one of the benefits of having them go through this committee is that rather than have all these nonprofits go out and get signatures and they just land on the ballot. This committee actually does research and asks them for data, both financial, service. They do a lot more scrutiny than just a number on the ballot. So I feel more satisfied that somebody has looked deeply into these requests. And we've tried to keep it around a similar number of supporting entities in our community that make our life better. Okay. Um, I see we have another comment from the public, uh, Red's iPhone. Fred's iPhone, are you there? Okay, and Vicki, is your hand still up from before? Did you, or did you have one? It's, brief? It, I, yeah, I have a clarification for Steve Whitaker. You can get the agendas, the minutes, the packet online. I have it up right now. Um, it's not hard to find. It's on the, uh, it's under Orca Media, and you just go down, and it said agendas and minutes, and you click on that, and you get it for every single meeting there is. So it's not hard, and it's easily available, and you can have it up on the screen at the same time you're looking or looking at the city meeting. So it's not hidden. Thanks, Vicki. Um, Fred's iPhone will give you one more chance. If there's someone on, on Fred's iPhone, if you could do star six to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, well, we've had, you've had the chance. Uh, We've had a motion and a second to approve the uh, the list as uh, as proposed. Uh, are you ready for the vote, Connor? I serve on the board of Mosaic. I should probably recuse myself, right? I don't think you're required to because it doesn't create any financial benefit to you. But it's up to you. Okay, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Hey, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. Moving on to item 10, discussion of mail-in voting for the city of Montpelier. And I believe the city clerk is uh, online to talk about this. Here we are. Well. <laughs> <laughs> actually i am in fact now i had a i had a a close covid contact for an extended time so i'm in self-quarantine for a couple days until i can test so 
I I ain't leaving my room in my house. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, so you got three. Uh, I don't know if you got the the amended Article One because what out, went out was kind of goofy. If not, it'll go up for the next meeting. Um, but regardless, you got three possible warnings depending on how you went. And uh, since then, the rocks the rocks Pelier, the Roxbury uh, Select Board met, and they did not authorize the school board to proceed with a uh, mail-in election. So that ain't happening. Um, they are gonna send out postcards to folks encouraging them to make absentee, uh, ab vote absentee, which is something some folks do. But uh, so right now that's where it's at. I would say if you wanted just to, God, I mean, I hate to say this cause I'm such a fan of the mail-in voting but my advice would be to not go that route because people will be too confused uh, i think there's a balance there and i i might be wrong i mean your mileage may vary but um so if you all do nothing but go on through the normal procedure of you know reviewing and approving the warning then the election would be a traditional kind of election so you'd have to you know, make a decision to make it a mail-in election, and then the city ballot would be mailed out only, and the CVPSA, the career center, and the school ballots, which would all be separate, would only be available at the polls or by specific absentee request for one or all of them. Um, obviously, if you wanted to go that route, we'd put a big bright purple piece of paper and something into the ballots that do go out from the city saying hey if you want to vote on these things then you have to order absentee or just come in um or not and it's a it's a real shame because if we do it the traditional way i think we'll go from the all-time highest turnout probably to the all-time lowest because of omicron um but anyways i'm um and i also think it's a shame honestly that the roxbury select board has this kind of power over us and uh, i i think there are those of us working are you know trying to lobby the legislature to change that but it would not be a change that would affect this time around so now we've got the whole story um so uh, so how this will work if somebody wanted to not come into city hall at all and vote completely by mail, they would need to submit four different absentee ballot applications or or would there be one form that you could create that would that people would use for all of them? Yeah, we would use the the one form for all of them. I mean that's the assumption with the form that we've used in the past. Okay. So we would just we would just do the same as the past. If somebody made an absentee request, we'd send them those three. It's I mean, I would imagine we would be flooded with absentee requests, but, um, you know, we'd, we'd make whatever you all wanted to work, work. And the Public Safety Authority is going to be in person anyway, because the other town is not uh, allowing that to be by absentee. Is that right? That's correct. I mean, it hasn't even been brought up uh, as far as I know. The Career Center as well. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks, John. That is definitely disappointing that this is the route. Um, I mean, I I agree. I think we shouldn't move ahead with just sending out the city ballot. I think that's too confusing for voters. Um, are you thinking about like a proactive postcard or something to reminding people they can request? I, I mean, I'm a little concerned. It's such a tight window, and with the mail being so slow and stuff, like. I, you know, I think it's not a given that that's a great idea. I was just curious what you were thinking about that. We could totally do that. Um, the Secretary of State did it for the primary last time around. Uh, God, that was so long ago. We've been in this for so long. Um, but they did that for the primary rather than send everything out. There are other communities that are doing that. I think Barry City is. I'll be honest with you, it's money that I don't really have to spend, but I'm sure we can find it somewhere. As you say, things are fungible and I'll we can dig around and 
and figure it out if you all wanted to do that. We can, judging by Front Porch Forum, I think we'd probably want to have uh, Federal Express make all the deliveries of those notifications. <laughs> uh, any other comment, Con Connor? No, I, I'm with Laura, and I never thought I'd be voting against like a all mail in ballot because I, I think it's so beneficial generally. But in a way, Roxbury sort of made the decision easy for us. And it's too unwieldy, and it has the potential to actually suppress turnout in some races. Uh, that I, I, I don't think we can go with that. So I would uh, echo Lauren and follow the clerk's recommendation on this one. Oh, it pains me to make that recommendation. Oh. <laughs> now, we're not voting yet. Just get a nod. Do the rest of you all agree with that? Okay. Um, I see we have comment from Peter Kelman. Um, <clears throat> I, um, yeah, Peter Kelman. I live in Montpelier. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to speak for myself. As a, as, as a voter, I would much prefer to vote the primary reason I vote, which is the Montpelier um, budget and the second, second most, the second most likely that I would want to vote on is the school budget. But it would not confuse me at all to receive Montpelier budget with a p purple piece of paper saying, if you want to vote in these others, um, you know, you can either you can request an absentee and we'll send it out to you, or you can uh, come in. I don't think that's confusing. The main, but the main one would go out to all of us. And I think that it would really be a shame if our city council and mayor uh, uh, votes were, you know, seriously depressed by. I, I think it would be even more confusing to say you got to go and you know to do each of these separately. Uh, so I, I disagree uh, with uh, the, the recommendation that John's making that you guys all seem to want to fall into. Think about it a little bit. Thank you. Well, I just I would throw in that that's a real legit, you know, legitimate opinion to have. And it's certainly a way we could go. I don't I say I don't make the recommendation I do with I, I do it with a heavy heart. But I also, you know, I'm not feeling like you gotta do it this way, you know? Can I ask a clarifying question just uh, for myself and for people that might be watching to, to the clerk? The, the, the way we're recommending doing it is outside of last year is the way we voted forever. Right? Everything would be on one ballot. People could either have absentee or come in to vote on voting day. So that in and of itself would not be confusing and that the school ballot and election uh, school board and city officials would all be on the same ballot. So in that regard, everything would be together. I, I think I heard Mr. Kelman say there would be multi separate ballots for all of, of those things. And I, I, I just want to be clear that that's not the case. That's true, except for the Career Center. Regardless, the Career Center will be on its own ballot. And I should mention that regardless of how we set this up, any non-citizen voters would receive a ballot that only has the city questions. I just want to make sure that's always out there. Uh, thank you. Um, Fred's iPhone. Yeah, I see your hand up again. So if you can unmute yourself and speak, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Okay, um, Fred, we're going to skip you and go to Vicki Lane. Um, I think that um, it would seem to me as though having it just simply revert back to the way we've always done it would be the most simple thing. Because if we have two different ones and people have to actually come in to vote on the school budgets and those other budgets, they're still going to have to come in. So, you know, um, it's not going to be of any benefit to mail in one and have to go in for another. Um, assuming that we can always early vote and I can come down there and fill it out, right? So I think it's just as easy to go back to the way we've always done it. and 
you know, if somebody needs to or wants to do the whole thing through the mail, I think it's relatively simple to ask for an absentee ballot. I mean, basically, <laughs> that's what I'm getting when I go down early to vote and say I want to vote early. And I think it's an absentee ballot that you hand me. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So I think that would be the simplest and best way to do it, I guess. I, I would think so, just from my standpoint. Thank you. Donna, I'm sorry. Sorry, Lauren. <laughs> um, one thought is, is, so if we move in, in this direction, I'm wondering about like if there's shaking the couch cushions for like a little ad campaign, like letting people know you know, thinking of some ways that we're getting the word out that people can request their absentee ballot. Um, you know, maybe maybe the mail mailing everyone a postcard is maybe we could like spend that same money and through other ways of trying to reach people. Um, I'm just, I mean, I I'm a huge fan of mail mail and voting, so I I think this just makes sense for this particular election, unfortunately, but. Um, everything we can do to encourage people to get their absentee ballot and get that one clear ballot where they're voting on everything seems to me, you know, one way we could approach it. I know doing mailings can be very complicated, but is there a, is there another water bill coming out between now and then? It's so that's that's a, I'll just throw that out as an idea. Okay. Um, Anyone in, in many member of the public in the room who wants to be heard on this? Okay, um, I don't think we need to take take a vote because we're just well, we're not voting to do a change to what we would have done without it. So thank you, John. Next item on the agenda. Stay well. Is, yep. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah. Next item on the agenda is the report from the auditor. Now, I think Kelly is coming up. Yep. I'm looking to see if the auditor is on. Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, so as you can see on the screen here, um, we've got uh, Miranda with us um, who is with RHR Smith and Company. Um, and I'm not sure if Ron is also here or not yet. I can't see the full screen, can, so we'll can see. Can you pull the mic up closer? Yeah, absolutely. Is that better? Ron will log on when he can. I don't think he's on quite yet. Okay. Um, and then I think we've also got um, Heather on the line too, um, who is our senior staff accountant. Um, so what I thought I would do just to touch this off is just go sort of a brief overview um, based on the memo that I submitted to Council and then turn it over to the auditors to um, introduce themselves maybe once more. Um, you've met them before. Uh, they were in last year around this time. Um, and then um, just kind of go over some discussion points um, from there. So without further ado, I'll get started. I don't have a presentation. I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights from the memo and then we'll have them take it away. Um, so for those following along online, um, the memo is also posted there um, under the agenda items. Um, I think long story short uh, with this audit, you know, we have a clean audit, which is very positive. Um, also just considering, you know, what we've been dealing with, uh, with the pandemic and deficit mitigation, um, we've been able to hold the line and also, um, you know, at least gain a little bit of ground on the general fund side of things. Um, but that's also with caveats. So I'll go over those as well, just so um, you have an understanding of what that means. Um, so we've got some work to do, um, but I think we're in pretty good shape. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to get into some of the numbers within the memo. Um, please stop me if you have questions or we can save those for the auditors too, um, either way. Um, so just starting right off the bat, um, looking at, uh, you know, sort of the net position of the city uh, for governmental activities, we increased our net position by about $1.15 million. For business-related activities, we increased that by just over $3 million. 
Um, so it's very positive, um, especially given these times. Um, the general fund total fund balance increased by approximately $315,000. Half of that is due to some unanticipated revenue, and then the other half is associated with expenditure reductions. Um, I will also say that um, due to the deficit mitigation plan, we were able to make the parking fund whole um, and move forward there. Um, there is a slight um, net position uh, downgrade that still exists, but I think we'll make that up um, as the revenues return. Um, and then just coming down the line here uh, for other major funds, the capital fund also has a little bit of a, a fund balance there that we do also intend to use um, during this budget development cycle to restore funding for projects. But that was um, created because we held funding aside to um, deal with the revenue shortfalls that we were experiencing. Um, and we, we were very conservative. And so now we have this pocket of money that we're gonna be able to use um, going forward and likely will not happen again. But you can see it highlighted here within the memo. It's about $435,000. And so just moving on to um, our enterprise funds. Um, my first year doing this, um, we were in a little bit of a different situation with the enterprise funds. Right now, two are positive, two are negative. Um, so the two that are positive are the water and sewer funds. The sewer fund in large part because of phase two of the waste, phase one, excuse me, phase one of the wastewater treatment facility and moving that forward in the grant funding that's been flowing through. Um, so you can see that pretty clearly here. Um, the parking fund um, decreased by about $100,000, which we that, that we did account for that with um, some of the transfer from the general fund and the deficit mitigation plan, but I anticipate that the rest of that net position will be made up um, with funding that comes in. So we um, opted to keep a little bit um, in the general fund, and you'll see further on in the memo, so that we can work towards the um, unrestricted fund balance policy. Um, and so you'll see that there. Um, and so just kind of moving through here, um, the other thing that I'll note is the um, district heat uh, utility um, ended up down about $146,000. And so it's just something to consider, especially as we discussed district heat, how it is performing um, year over year. Um, and then moving on into debt, um, you can see that we increased um, debt service by about $10 million. Again, that's associated with phase one of the wastewater treatment facility. And so um, we will also see um, increases in debt in future years just based on what we're trying to do um, and investing in our infrastructure and the like. And so we'll be monitoring the policy thresholds pretty closely and then seeing what's available. Um, right now, there are a lot of opportunities out there with federal funding that I don't know that we'll see again. So we're trying to position ourselves um, there. And then just in terms of some of the budgetary highlights, I'm just going to uh, get down to sort of the last paragraph of the memo. Um, just noting that the unrestricted fund balance in the general fund increased by about $185,000, which is a pretty good place to be. Um, but we've got to weigh that against some items like TIF, for example, and district heat. Um, TIF, we're working to finance that. And so the liability will be off of the general fund, which will be great. Um, but then we also need to keep an eye on district heat. And so if you were to look at page 21, you'll see that that is in deficit to about 382,000. So that would also need to be taken into consideration um, if we were to factor that in. Um, and so I just wanna highlight the unrestricted fund balance policy and where we would really ideally want to be. Um, we would wanna see in the general fund from an unrestricted position, about $2.2 million. Um, we're not there. Um, we're working towards it. I think, you know, we, we've made at least a little bit of progress in that um, way. Um, but we also have some other pressures that we just need to consider as we move forward. Um, so I realize that's kind of a, a fast uh, summary of what happened in 21. Um, but I think because of the, the tough decisions that you all made, we were able to sort of um, stay on track and will be well positioned um, in 22 and beyond. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Miranda and see what she has to add, unless if there are questions here in the room. Okay, go ahead. 
Jack's giving me the go ahead. So um, Miranda, take it away. Hi, Kelly, thank you. I think that was a great synopsis of FY21. Um, I am Miranda McDonald, and I just received word that Ron might be joining us. Um, I don't know if he's been able to log on yet. Um, I'm here. I'm ah, here. He did get here. Miranda's um, the brains of the outfit, though, folks. <laughs> um, it, you know, in, in the big one is, in our opinion, the financial the financials are presented um, fairly. Um, I know everybody's eager for that. Um, Kelly touched on the high points. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna repeat that. Um, it's in your memo. Um, you know, COVID happened in FY21, and that was huge. But I think y'all were proactive in making decisions um, to mitigate some of the. You know, I, I one of the things was you didn't charge for parking. I know that. Um, but you also reduced expenditures um, to help mitigate some of that fund balance. So um, you were proactive in your decisions. And I know Kelly and Heather have been active in looking at um, some federal funds and state funding coming in as well to help. Um, Kelly did mention that there's some opportunity for um, grants um, to help with some of the projects um, that, that uh, in during this time period. Um, so I know that's, uh, that's what they're looking into um, with that. Um, and then she mentioned some other talking points with the long-term debt. Um, Montpelier has your ceiling, um, 8.2 in the 15% which you're looking at, um, but you also have like phase two of your sewer funds and some other projects that you're gonna do, um, you know, and, and I know they're actively looking at some other options. Um, and then the TIF fund, capitalizing what's there and looking at some financing options um, to, since unfortunately with the parking garage did not go through. Um, I, it was, uh, it was a very eventful year, but I think, um, Kelly and Heather did a great job, um, and their finances and managing it and, um, being informative and making decisions for the year. <laughs> Thanks, Miranda. Do we have any uh, questions from members of the council? Um, <clears throat> at this point, we would typically uh, vote to accept the audit report. I know that we got the report uh, fairly late, and I want to make sure that people, I, Peter, I see you have your hand up. I, I want to make sure people are comfortable and satisfied that they've had an adequate time, so we could not, not act on that now and vote, put it on the agenda for next time to accepted if anyone wanted to do that. Um, so why don't you think, ponder that while I call on Peter Kelman. Uh, hi, Peter Kelman. I don't know about anybody else, but I, I couldn't see what she was showing. It wasn't coming, it, it wasn't showing up on any screen. She didn't have a presentation shared on screen. So how did we know, page 21? And, and I mean, she kept going through these, we didn't, I even, went to the agenda and tried to find, I mean, you know, the agenda packet, but. Recording stopped. I, I hope you guys. Recording in progress. I hope you guys were there and, and could see could see it, but we couldn't at home. Peter and Jack, may I suggest that, you know, maybe we wanted to put it in your hands. I, know, I, I believe it was all part of your package. And it sounds like you guys haven't had enough time to review it. How about we consider this another conversation for another day? You know, as you guys get a chance to, to like give Kelly some feedback and we'd be more than happy to have, you know, hop on. So everybody's comfortable, you know, before, uh, you know, before anything is, uh, you know, um, uh, put to rest for lack of a better word when it comes to June 30, 21. Donna. Well, the packet was sent to us direct as council members. It came out after our packet. 
So it would be good to allow the public access and us more time. So I would move that we put table it to the next meeting. Second. Okay. And can, can I just say also, when, when you discuss it next, it's very hard in Zoom land to follow what somebody's saying. You, you can't just keep saying the memo, the memo, the memo. We, you need to really let the people at home find where it is because we got to do two things on the screen. We're, lo we're looking at Zoom and then we've got to look at the agenda packet piece. So we really need to know what that piece is and what page you're on when you say things. Okay, thanks, so, Peter. Peter, yeah, would it be help? Would it be helpful if we prepare like a PowerPoint presentation and you know, kind of like the highlights and talking points and shared our screen with everybody, including the public? You're muted, Peter. Yes, that would be great. I I really think it's very important for the public to understand um, the budgets and understand some of the large items that that had to be compensated for because otherwise people say, oh, look, they're raising our taxes and they don't understand why. And I think the, the <laughs> more we can understand the way these very large budgets work, especially in a year that was impacted by so many different variables, the more supportive the public will be of the budgets going forward. So I Peter, think we agree. We agree. We're all in on that. And certainly we don't want you guys to you know, to move forward and make any business decisions until you guys are comfortable with that. So, so maybe, you know, again, you know, the next meeting, Kelly, you know, we, uh, we sit down, pull out some excerpts of that uh, thing that you wanted to put in your hands and, 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 and Peter, just, just know, and Jack, just know city council know, you know, that Kelly wanted to put this in your hands sooner than later to let you know, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that, that, that this process was at an end you know, and, uh, and to have these conversations. And if we need to have another conversation until we're all comfortable, we'll prepare that presentation with Kelly and Heather. Okay, great. Thanks, Ron. We'll figure on seeing you next week. Uh, uh, Stephen and then Linda Berger. Uh, I, I want to, whether it's an error or omission or whatever, uh, Montpelier and Barry City are the two members of Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Bev Hill is the treasurer and handling in her treasurer role, the finances for CVPSA. The CVPSA charter, which y'all are members of and sworn to uphold, requires an annual audit. And yet that audit is not included here. And there's no provisions or plans or discussion or budget for another audit. So I'm saying that, that this is the place where that CVPSA audit should happen. I don't know if there's still time to get it done by the time this is delivered and accepted, but it can't, we can't just ignore the charter of a municipality that we're a member of. But I think so that, to, to, go ahead. To point of clarification, first of all, there's no reason in the world to be bringing up the treasurer because she has nothing to do with the CVPSA audit if you read the statute. The statute clearly says that the board of directors of CVPSA shall cause an annual audit. If the board of directors of CBPSA were to request that we include their funds in our audit, we would do so. So I would suggest that you read the statute and raise your concerns with the appropriate board. I'm raising them. Montpelier is a member of that municipality and this it is being mismanaged and it needs to be audited in order to be in compliance with the charter, which this body is also responsible for. You may be having to cover for one of your members, but that's it, whatever it takes. I don't need to read the statute to know that you don't just ignore an annual audit requirement. And Bev Hill, as a treasurer, was involved in our audit, presumably. Well, okay. No, it's actually clear in, in the chart, in the statute, that the treasurer is not involved in the audit. And that's a separate and, municipality. And it is a separate municipality, any more than this board demands audits or has anything to do with the audit for say the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District, any of those other independent agencies of which we are members, those boards of directors are responsible for those audits. Or not and, as the case or may Or not be. as the case may be, not the city of Montpelier. Well, I, I'm raising it as a concern because this is probably the audit that should include CVPSA if, if it's gonna get done. Well, noted. Uh, Linda Berger. 
Thank you. I just had a question from the brief presentation from the auditor. Um, I got anxious because somehow the um, the phase one wastewater treatment facility um, debt and the parking garage debt were starting to get intermingled in her presentation um, and about future funding. So I, I, I'm a neophyte in understanding this and just kind of leaving that dangling. Um, I, you may need to clarify that a bit more when you're talking about the bonds in the next section. Is that question directed towards us or to, 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 to Kelly? I'm sorry. It's directed to the council. I think that's, uh, so, so there's a couple of things to unpack there, Linda. Um, there are the proposed bonds for this coming year, which we will be addressing during the public hearings. And then there are the bonds for phase one, which have already been issued and the parking garage bond, which is already issued in which there were expenditures made against, which were part of the audit report. So the, so the auditors were talking about that, which has already happened. And so I do think if there's questions about how they were referred to, it probably should come from the auditors. But I don't believe they were commingled. Um, I think they are, they're from separate funds. I think they were just talking about how they've affected our outstanding indebtedness and how they will be managed in the future. Right, and other options for phase two was a quote. And so that's why my question. Well, um, I, again, I defer to the auditors. My, took, okay. my take was that they were simply saying, you've increased your debt by a certain amount and you've got additional debt coming, uh, other options with debt too. So it was more of a be mindful of your debt load. It wasn't that there was an auditing, but I don't want to put words in, in Ron or Miranda or Kelly's mouth. And Bill, I concur with phase one and Kelly, you're going to have to hop in here because it's kind of, it's not a blur to me, but you know, I, I know that there was some, some new different nuances with phase one and phase two. Phase two, Kelly, is what we've been talking about as far as the taxability or not the taxability, you know, with a new, uh, with a new issue of that bond, Kelly. Um, well, you're, that's TIF, Ron. I think, I think we're confusing TIF and the wastewater plant. Okay. Bill, you you're have, correct on phase one. You're correct on phase one, though. Do you have an answer to that now, Kelly, or do you think it would be better to? Yeah, um, okay. absolutely. So um, apologies for any confusion. Um, so I did mention um, you know, TIF along with the general fund just because, as it stood, if we were to um, not finance that TIF debt, it would be a liability on the general fund, which would then impact our unrestricted fund balance which is sort of the, you know, kind of a measure of health, if you will. And so I was just wanting to identify that, while it looks really good on the bottom line for our unrestricted fund balance in terms of what we have there, we also need to consider some of the other factors that are at play. And I so just, I was trying to full disclosure, kind of share what some of those things were. Um, so my apologies if that was a bit confusing. Um, I can see where that might be confusing. Um, so thank you very much for asking. Um, and then, you know, additionally with phase one, um, you know, we are highlighting that that has sort of hit the books in full this fiscal year. Um, and there are future implications for the wastewater treatment facility as we move forward. And so it's just trying to kind of provide the continuum of, you know, what that might look like. Um, so I hope that helps. And I'm happy to provide any detail that's needed to clarify. And Kelly, maybe now the next presentation would be a good time where we just address all of the phases, including the TIF, so we're all clear on, uh, you know, the details of all of those. How does that sound? Absolutely. Okay, thank just, you. Yeah, Bill. Just to the extent there's any confusion tonight, I'd like to, I'd like to say that I really pushed Kelly to push the auditors to have a report for tonight, feeling that it was important for the City Council to hear about the financial con condition of the city before we have our final two budget <laughs> meetings. As a result, we only got the draft report last night and the full report today. And I did advise uh, the chair that it might be, it might make sense to actually not uh, accept the report until people have had a time to digest it. But I really felt you needed to hear this. So if, if it feels rushed, um, that's on me. Uh, and I'm sorry. 
um, but uh, they did push to, to get that out uh, so that you could at least begin to have this conversation and we're happy to continue it next week. Great, thanks. Okay, I think we can move on to the next item on the agenda, which is... Are you all set with us, Bill? Yes, thank yes. you. Listen, everybody be well. Thanks, you too. Jack, there's a motion on the floor. Oh, there's, has there been a second? Yes. Okay, the motion is to, to lay this on the table until our next uh, meeting. That's correct. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we've laid it on the table for our next meeting. Okay. <clears throat> Item number 12 is the first public hearing for the annual meeting. Who's going to be kicking this off? Uh, this is really, and I before think... we before you start, I will open the public hearing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be proud. Yes. Um, so this week's version of this probably isn't that uh, meaty. This is uh, uh, the the first draft of the the ballot, the, the warning, uh, which would simply contain the articles that would be voted on. Um, next week, obviously, you have to take your final vote for what the ballot would be. As you discussed earlier, there were um, there were three options based on the way you've chose to you, you wanted to go with voting, and I think you've made that decision now. So that will bring us to the one warning that way. Um, things that you'd want to consider. Would, so to, typically the warning has the budget, the ballot items that you've already chosen to put on, the candidates, those kinds of things. We'll be going through those ballot items uh, shortly. Uh, and you'd want to be thinking about the order and um, the final versions. And of course, the final numbers will be determined when you set the final budget. So you wouldn't do that. So, Typically, this is this is a pretty pro forma one. I think that you know, I'm not telling people they can't discuss the warning because, of course, they can. But really, the the budget and the bonds are the the bulk of what this is. You know, makes up the warning. Okay. Um, anyone want to start start this out from uh, from council? Yes, Donna. I had a question for John. I you asked for and I sent you the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority to elect an at large, but it's not on this list. Will it uh, be inserted? Uh, okay, this that's something that didn't quite make it on this iteration. It'll be on next week's iteration. As well as, and I didn't communicate with Kelly about this, but there's going to be a uh, a monetary ask, I think, is what you told me from the CVPSA. So well, that'll be reflected on the final, too. I don't believe it's on this one. No, you actually have it on here. You don't. Oh, have my it. bad. You so don't have, no, no, no. have things, and <laughs> yeah. I'm messed up. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Together we'll get there, John. Um, yeah, the <laughs> statement for the money is what I submitted was as of the last Public Safety Authority board meeting would be stated with the 30,000 and then in parentheses shows the Barry and Montpelier share, but I'll, I'll resend you that and oh, I'll re resend you the at large section. Oh, perfect. no, I should have that, but go ahead and resend it anyways. Uh, might as well. And was there anything else related to the CV uh, PSA that we wanted to be taking up uh, tonight? I'd, I'd heard some conversation about uh, a proposal to discuss whether we should be uh, discuss the future of Montpelier in the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. And is it, would this be an appropriate time to talk about that? Uh, um, yes, I, I've also heard talk about that. And what it is is that the voters actually voted to put Montpelier onto the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority membership. And to withdraw, the voters would have to vote to, to take Montpelier out, same way with Barry. And there is some consideration to whether or not how committed the council is being a member and whether you want to put it to the voters to see if there is uh, community support. 
Connor, were you gonna? Yeah, no, sure. I, and I, I think maybe I would recommend in the next couple of weeks, you know, just throwing that out there as a possibility, maybe to hear from some members of the committee to see if there's a, this is a direction we want to continue going with regionalization. I know there's been quite a few bumps in the road. Uh, sometimes it does feel like meetings are adversarial. It's, you know, a lot of people putting a lot of hard work into this and are we getting the results we want? Um, so I, I think as we, as we look at the future, it, it's a legitimate question to ask. Um, and maybe in the next couple of weeks, if we want to hear from folks and see if that's a, something that the community and members of the committee would like to put on the ballot here. Well, I think you have your two appointees are actually logged in tonight. They they may not be prepared to talk, but they might want to be invited to come back to talk. I, I just procedurally note that if if you were to consider that for a ballot item for this year, um, it would need to be done at next week's meeting because that's when we would be setting the ballot. Right. Would have to be done at next week's meeting. Yes. Because that's yes. when you would be setting the ballot. So that would, 20th. if you were going to do that, you would warn that and people would have time to prepare and come in. If you don't want to do it in March or if you don't want to do it at all, then you've got as much time as you want. <coughs> Any other comments on the council? I know this is kind of sprung on you, so you may not uh, have fully uh, developed positions on this yet. Um, but uh, I'll just say that uh, we can anticipate further discussion about of this uh, uh, next uh, meeting. Steve, is that what you're rising to speak on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you recall, I asked that uh, this get added to the agenda at the last meeting because it it is in a crisis uh, management dysfunction. Uh, but I've also called numerous times the fact that especially in the context of the budget discussion, the city has a conflict of interest. The city as an entity relies on revenue, 400, close to $400,000 in revenue that would go away if the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority launches a regional dispatch facility or, or PSAP or combined PSAP and dispatch facility. And could you say what PSAP stands for for people public who safety know. answering point it's where the 911 calls are first answered and that's the most time efficient and safest way to chart to handle emergency calls is to not have them answered in Williston and transferred via telephone with delay and then have to repeat the same information to another dispatcher in Montpelier so my point is that it's a very challenging discussion to have because of that conflict of interest and that in effect we we have the luxury of not having to have the ethical dimension of the discussion because uh the city mismanager threw on the consent agenda the approval of the cfmas contract which is the capital fire mutual aid they are the group of fire chiefs uh, that run a really slipshod organization. They don't, uh, they've only recently, after many, many years of requests, started keeping minutes, and it's the, for the first time they opened, a minute, meet, opened the meeting of the Communications Committee. It's run by, but they don't respond to public records requests. I've, I've asked for, CBPSA has been wanting to meet with the other regional towns to get more members to join. It's, it's not sustainable with just Barry and Montpelier, both with different conflicts of interest. Barry wants to stay an island unto itself and fund its own radio system. Barry Town is doing the same thing. It's the least cost efficient and least safe. But Montpelier, in order to get that $400,000 revenue, requires a regional radio system. The question is, are we going to attempt to spend public money in Montpelier or secure grant money to monopolize the ownership of that radio system and have all these towns be captive customers because we're addicted to that money or are we going to really do what's right and engage and co-govern a regional authority that's going to be accountable our current dispatch system is not accountable or transparent deadly incidents happened. The Mark Johnson shooting happened because the dispatcher did not make the officers aware that this record from a few weeks prior uh, 
indicated this person wants to jump off a bridge, is off his meds and is suicidal. That could have saved his life. Several other incidents, ambulance calls getting delayed for half an hour why? because somebody went on break and forgot to dispatch. Those, the management committee of which some members are here of that manager has never met, has never warned a meeting, has never kept notes or minutes. And so all of these errors get swept under the rug. A regional authority with transparent governance and accountability is the way to go. And we just have to get over the fact that we're gonna lose our little unaccountable little radio shop. But this is why this needed to be on the agenda because currently uh, the leadership, if you can call it that, of CVPSA is trying to run it into the ditch. For this to be, to, for this first discussion of potentially pulling out of it, I mean, last at the last meeting you heard me take issue with it and, and question the fact that the police chief is putting in an email to the city mismanager that we're going to dissolve CVPSA. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you for just a minute. I've I've heard you say this a couple of times. I'm going to ask you to uh, speak and refer to people with respect. That's uh, respect. That's respect. That's an accurate no, characterization. It not, it it's a First respect. Amendment protected right. So it, you, it is a protected yes. right. I'm asking you to conduct. I respect that he's mismanaging the town, and I will continue to refer, reference it that way. But my point is that this. Then you saw the mayor say, "I support." what bill is doing as if the mayor were the the you know queen here it's like this is a council decision you all have an obligation to learn your due diligence and to be informed and be voting a majority on this thing this is not something that the mayor could just say i support bill okay um you're well beyond two minutes we'll, we'll be taking this up again next week uh, just Done. briefly for the record uh, for folks that are listening City does take in over $400,000 in dispatch revenue. We also spend over $860,000. So any revenue that we get only offsets expenditures. Um, so to the extent that our, we are uh, so-called addicted to the money, presumably if there were a regional dispatch, all of the expenses would go away as well. So the city would actually benefit by about $400,000, although we would then be contributing to the regional entity. Uh, so they're really, you know, from a financial perspective, uh, the revenue is simply a, a revenue for doing the business that we have, and we we are a regional entity. Uh, we have spent a lot of time trying to figure out a different way to do it. I, I think more importantly, there were some uh, assertions made, and I just want to be clear that everyone understands those were opinions that were expressed and not factual about certain incidents. The speaker's opinions, um, they don't have factual basis. Thank you. Um, Peter Kelman. Uh, yeah, can, can I just ask once again that if you're discussing something, you let the, us know out here in Zoom land where to find it. I, 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 I gather you were starting to discuss the document called City Meeting Warning for March 1, 2021. Is that correct? Yes, and it's... Uh... It's in the. Uh... I have it. I have it. But I didn't. But you know, you you just leapt into it. Nobody. You just started talking about it without telling us what it was you were talking about or what article you started talking about this thing that <clears throat> Steve Whitaker just finished talking about. Can we refer to the document by name? Can we refer to the article that we're talking about, please? Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else looking to be heard uh, on, the, on this item tonight? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing on uh, Article Number 12. Um, we're now up to Article Number 13, first public, public hearing for the FY23 budget. And Donna, were you going to say something? I just had a question. Is this when we set the second? Do we have to set the second public well, hearing? It's already scheduled. Okay. The, this wasn't... isn't this isn't like a uh, an ordinance or a. Great. It's already being okay. worn that way. That procedural question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I also want to be clear. Um, the the law doesn't require a public hearing on the warning. It just requires that you approve it. We do this for the 
you know, we're going above and beyond here so that people can be engaged in these conversations. Um, so you don't have to vote on any of those things. Okay, next up is the first public hearing for the fiscal 23 budget. The, uh, uh, I assume we're going to have. Uh, I'm gonna okay. Down there. Okay, great. Okay, you want to do that? Okay. Um, we ordinarily would take a break at 8.30. It's 8.08, so we'll take our 10-minute ten, break now. Be back here at... Uh... <clears throat> and we can start up again. We are Great. on uh, item 13, the first public hearing for the fiscal year 2023 budget. The uh, document is in the, uh, in the packet. And we have a presentation by the city manager, and it should be visible to everyone in Zoom. Correct. And I'd also note that um, the full detail of the budget book is available online. It's quite lengthy, but if anybody wants to go into any of the detail, I will not be referring to any of the pages in that budget book, at least during the presentation, if there are questions. Um, I, I, we also have technically two public hearings scheduled for the the budget and the bonds. This presentation will include both the material for both public hearings, and we can still break them out as you see fit, but it, it all flows together. So uh, all that information will be um, here together. So I'm going to do the overview of the budget and the bonds, and then at the end, we'll have time for questions from obviously the council, the public, and we do have um, all the departments available, I believe, or hopefully all of them, uh, for a specific questions about department operations, department budgets, and uh, obviously any general questions are happy to answer that. Um, okay, so we'll uh, call the public hearing of the, uh, uh, the budget to order and you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is the first of two public hearings of the budget. This is a budget that has been proposed to the voters by the city council. Uh, the way the process works is the manager and staff recommend a budget to the city council. Uh, you held workshops on that budget in December, and this is now the city council's budget. I'm, as your employee, presenting it on your behalf. Um, so the council's, um, move, hold on, something blocking our great graphics here. You don't see that part though. Oh, it's not up there? Okay. Not on the screen. Oh, okay. Uh, so the budget goals, but I couldn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> the budget okay. goals uh, that the council set out were to uh, implement the strategic plan to rebuild from the COVID cuts, which you just heard us talking about during the uh, auditor's report, the, the impact on some of the, the finances and the decisions that were made in order to keep our finances solvent, to deliver responsible services, uh, to address challenges with revenues, and to stay uh, with our goal annually is to stay within the inflation rate, which um, as of the end of December was 7.0%, which is actually just released today uh, for December. Oh, this is, uh, am I not moving forward here? What's, what am I doing wrong? Oh, there we go. Oh. So revenues, um, we actually had some good news in revenues in the past year, uh, which was helpful to us. We, we received full pilot funding uh, of 1.254 million and we've budgeted for that same amount for next year. Um, we are rooms and meals and budgeted, uh, rooms, meals and alcohol tax are improving. We've budgeted 253,000 for next year based on the trends that we're seeing. That's still about now, it was about 275,000 two years ago in the budget, but we had also budgeted about 200,000 last year. So it's, it's improving, it's not all the way back. Last year, the, uh, in the current fiscal year, the, the state did increase the highway aid by about $80,000 to 300,000, and we're anticipating that to continue for next year. Our building permits, uh, we had been budgeting 100,000. They had dropped to about 50,000. We're back up to budgeting 75,000, but it's still not up to the full 100,000. But still, when you add these all together, the net increase uh, from our last year's budget to this year's budget was $488,000. So that was obviously very helpful in trying to put our budget together. 
So we look at our strategic plan, and uh, I am going to include items that show up in all sorts of different places in the budget, but just showing how they, how we got to where we wanted to be. Uh, at the end of the uh, item of improved community prosperity, we've included the fifty thousand dollars for economic development. The child care facility feasibility, excuse me, is being included in uh, studies and uh, about the recreation future recreation center. We have a, a bond issue that would address additional outdoor recreation. And uh, just as an aside, we've recently purchased some more land for outdoor recreation uh, this year. We've included forty-five thousand dollars for the homelessness task force. We've got the 131,050 for the community fund that we just awarded 134,000 for. We've maintained the 32,600 for Montpelier Live, and we restored $10,000 for the arts fund. So the economic development prior to COVID had been 100,000, the arts fund prior to COVID had been 20,000. So those two are restored to 50% of where they were. All the others are at 100%. Uh, under our goal of uh, provide responsible and engaged government we have fully staffed city government so uh, our proposed budget has every every position filled with due union agreements and pay scales in we've got twenty five thousand dollars for the website upgrade we have ten thousand dollars for the capital area neighborhoods uh, that is also a reduction from twenty thousand however um because we're not, we didn't actually start the work with them until halfway through the year this year. We're going to use ten thousand of this year's for the first six months, and then this ten and that for the the next full twelve months. So we should be whole on that uh, until next year's budget. Uh, our capital plan includes two hundred thirty thirty thousand dollars for buildings and grounds for our ADA transition plan projects, including the uh, the elevator here in City Hall. We've got $75,000 for communications, data, public outreach, uh, $30,000 for committee support, committee outreach and um, equity, and $15,000 for advocacy. Uh, in our goal to create more housing, uh, we have the full funding of $110,000 in the new funding for this upcoming budget for housing trust fund. We're also restoring 60,000 using some old budget for money that we had cut last year uh, for COVID. Under our practice, good environmental stewardship, we've included $100,000 to implement the net zero plan. Um, we've included $250,000 for the first net zero project, the DPW pellet furnace. We've got 34,000 for dam removal seed money. We've continued to fund my ride for four hundred for forty thousand dollars, excuse me, and we've got six hundred thousand dollars to uh, develop the confluence park. Under our build, maintain sustainable infrastructure, we've got a CIP capital improvement plan, equipment plan funding uh, about two point one five million, ARPA funding, capital reserve funding about two point five million. I'm going to go into all of this in more detail later, but there's rough funding. Under public health and safety, we've expanded the social worker for uh, the Montpelier Police Department social worker, or our contract for that, uh, for another uh, half. We have funding for body worn cameras, as discussed earlier, uh, that technology and vendor has not yet been selected. You funded dispatch consoles last year, so that money has been carried forward or partially funded, and we are uh, looking to proceed with that in conjunction with the City of Barrie as possible. The uh, police review committee recommendations are included um, in the police operating budget for the most part, uh, including the CIT. Uh, so I'm going to get that wrong. Uh, but the CIT program, crisis intervention team. Thank you. That's what I thought it was. But I didn't want uh, the crisis intervention uh, team uh, program. So that, and in fact, our team recently was selected to present at a national conference because of the work they're doing in their cooperatives. We also have 425,000 for housing services hub and bathrooms that we've allocated to or put toward crisis situations. So our capital improvement plan, this is the money we allocate each year in our budget. As you can see, we've increased the total funding that includes projects, capital equipment, and our, and, um, our debt service. So as you can see, we've improved, uh, we've increased the funding uh, $223,000 from last year. And as you can look, we're still about $223,000 below 
uh, where we are our, our pre-COVID target event. So when we do next year's budget, we'll probably be looking to add that up as, as well onto that to get back to our, our funding level that was at 2.375 million and eventually probably even higher, but first we'll get there. Um, so again, all the detail is in the budget book, but um, very briefly, in our, in our CIP budget, we have about 590,000 for streets and roads, 230,000 for buildings and grounds, uh, the ADA, 68,000 for parks and trees, 63,000 for sidewalks, 27,500 for bridges, 20,000 for transportation, and 75,000 to help manage all of these projects. And when people ask us about that, that is when we occasionally need a design or survey or those kinds of extra costs to help prepare projects that don't necessarily fall accordingly until we keep that in, in the CIP. And I'm going to go through this in detail in part because, not in huge detail, but because we hear a lot about the infrastructure needs and people's desire for us to fund infrastructure. And, I, and the city council made a huge commitment, uh, is proposing a huge commitment to infrastructure this year. I'll make sure that we go through that. In our equipment, uh, we have uh, 108,000, almost 109,000 for fire and EMS, uh, 95,000 for police, uh, for DPW, excuse me, 76,000 for police, 50,000 dollars for information technology infrastructure and 26,000 for parks. Again, the detail of all of that is in the budget book, particular pieces of equipment. But there's more to capital than just our CIP this year. So we have ARPA part one, uh, the American, uh, I'm going to blank on this. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the Restoration Act, um, American Recovery Plan Act. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so the first part was allocated, uh, and that was to restore revenues, and we have a lot of flexibility with that. So we have a lot of individual projects in there, but essentially they, they split out into $620,000 for delayed roads, bridges, and retaining walls that have been improved from prior, had been delayed from prior years, and $420,000 for deferred of his, of, uh, equipment purchases. And this is where the $60,000 to restore the housing trust fund is coming from. So in addition to what we just saw in, in this year's capital fund, we've got this. We have, then we have ARPA 2, what we call, and this was is the second portion of our funding, which had been allocated, uh, which had some restrictions on it. Now we have some good news. We, we may, we're just, there was a new rule um, released last week. It appears that there may be a lot more flexibility with this funding than we had originally thought. Uh, and uh, because it isn't tied to the budget vote. We can still consider that, but for now, we're keeping the the um, allocations the way we had them. So we've got about seventy-five thousand for community outreach and data information. This is the four hundred twenty-five thousand is for homelessness issues, including the public bathroom. Uh, Fifty thousand dollars for an EV charging station for city vehicles, and four hundred fifty thousand dollars for water and sewer improvements. Keep our eye on that. We may get, I mean, we may want to keep this list, but we also may have more flexibility. Bill, sorry. Yes. Just a just a quick, real quick question, just in terms of timing of of the ARPA round two relative to FY twenty three budget. Like, what's the expect? When do we expect the first round to come in, the second round, and so, how that all sure. fits in? Just so, so first, I understand it. So the first round received in the bank. We've we've got it. We can expend it whenever. We need to. The second is expected to come in, I think, late August, early September. Uh, you know, I think it's a policy decision on our part whether we wait we have the cash in hand to spend it or if we have a plan and we want to front the money and get back to, you know, we'll have to look at the eligibility, but I mean, we'll have that money pretty consistent, consistent with the, the fiscal year. We also have a restoration reserve, uh, and that is monies that we had, a CIP restoration reserve, that is monies that we had uh, previously raised for capital plans and then had held um, because we were concerned about cash and concerned about the fiscal, you know, the mitigation plan that Kelly and the auditors described. And uh, it turned out that because of some of these revenues that came in stronger than we expected, we are able to now release those monies. So uh, we're putting an additional $180,000 in, in paving funds. If you add that to the 590 that's in there, that brings us to the total, the annual total that we need to reach and maintain uh, what we call the 70 
70 PCI, the pavement condition index. Doesn't mean we're gonna reach that this year, but that's the funding level that we need to have each year. So this will be the first year we've actually funded it fully. So that's great. And uh, it, you know, and I think it, strategically, as you look at this and you say, well, we need to add 223,000 to next year's capital plan. You know, there's 180,000 right there. That's a, we reach that level and stay at. We also funded another 221,000 in, in delayed equipment. So we're catching up uh, on these deferred expenses. And then we have $34,000 in seed money for dam removal. None of these capital plans um, anticipate any spending from the federal infrastructure bill, which is another huge source of money. We just don't know the rules and regulations of that, so that there, there may be even greater opportunities to invest in our infrastructure. But this, based on what we know, this is what we have. So if we look at this total, before we even get to the bonds, we're putting uh, about 2.35 million into projects, infrastructure projects, another slightly over a million into equipment and 560,000 to sort of community related uh, funding project type thing. So a total of over $4 million being invested um, in our various forms of infrastructure. So I think, you know, from my perspective and I think the council's perspective, that's very exciting to be able to sort of get caught up with to where we need to be. So we also have four proposed bonds. I'm going to go into them each in detail, but in general, uh, we have one for East State Street for 7.2 million, uh, 4 million of that from the general fund, 3.2 million of that from the water sewer funds, uh, purchase of land for a future rec center for 1.5 million. Although we'll probably discuss this a little bit later at the end of the meeting, but I'm going to recommend that we bump that up to $2 million from 1.5, but for now it's it's been in the budget at 1.5. We have a group of infrastructure projects uh, at 1.8 million, um, again, which I'll go through. And then of course the big water resource recovery facility phase two for 16.4 million, which you heard about in detail a week or two ago. Uh, and you can see the totals at the bottom of what those all, all come to. But looking at them each individually, and these are the, the bonds that, you know, so this is sort of the public hearing and the bond portion of this presentation. East State Street, 7.2 million, 4 million from the general fund, and 3.2 million from water and sewer funds. This would be a complete re reconstruction of East State Street from Maine to college. We would be putting new water and sewer lines underneath, uh, and including a, and then a rebuilt road base and, and all those kinds of things, as well as a new surface on the top. And a combined sewer overflow uh, will be corrected by installation of a new stormwater outfall. It's been a long, so all of these have been long-standing problems. While we're at it, the Blanchard parking lot behind the, the fire station will be improved since we're doing paving work anyway, we'll, we'll do that. There has been a periodic odor problem at East State and Maine that will be corrected as part of this project. And we are um, getting an additional 1.4 million in ARPA beyond our amounts to help fund this project. Uh, so. It's a very comprehensive project. It'll probably take a couple of years to complete given its complexity and its size, uh, but it certainly is, is um, one we've been prepping now for a bunch of years and solves, uh, addresses a lot, of, a lot of key issues. Rec Center land, uh, this is essentially proposed to, again, it's currently 1.5 million and we may, uh, I, th I think we should raise it to 2 million. The general fund, it's, it's supplemented by recreation reserve. It would purchase the entire current Elks Club property, not all the buildings and land there. Could be done in conjunction with private investment. Um, that's you know not for sure, or certainly a future project could be. Be clear that it will require future capital investment for anything new that goes there. This would, this would be acquiring property, not building anything. And uh, however, the size of the parcel is uh, significant. We provide for facilities, parking, trails, fields, and much more. A lot of opportunity there for many different things. We have looked at other locations for the recreation for a recreation center. The, the center on Berry Street has significant problems: asbestos size, parking, uh, no no footprint, and renovation there was going to cost six plus million dollars. And not gain any real space or damages. We looked at a possible rec center at the Elm Street facility, <coughs> where the pool and courts and, and uh, all the fields are. And uh, 
that was possible, but again, it, it also had a smaller footprint and again, no expansion opportunity because it's competing with those existing facilities for space. And uh, again, parking, you know, those, anyone who's been to the pool in the summer knows that it's already pretty limited and to, to create uh, even more of a demand there. So it really wasn't an ideal situation. This is an opportunity that could really provide uh, change outside recreation in the city for a long time and, and with all a whole variety of different needs. Uh, the miscellaneous infrastructure grouping, uh, also from the general fund, this is a series of different projects uh, and, and the council is opting to group them together be, just uh, because it makes sense. 600,000 for Confluence Park, uh, that's approximately half the price of that con uh, project. Most of the other half has been raised or committed in one way or another. So it matched grant and private funding to complete that project. $550,000 for and Confluence Park, for those that aren't aware, is uh, as you cross the bike path by Shaw's, it's to the left, the open space to the left near the confluence of the uh, Woduski River and the North Branch River. And right now it's just an open lot. This would uh, be to redevelop it. There's a crude design uh, and ultimately lot of access down to the river for recreational activities, as well as sitting and recreation, perhaps performances and those kinds of things. Uh, $550,000 for the Main Street and Berry Street intersection. This is phase one of the Main Street corridor plan. This will provide some physical improvements to that inter intersection, as well as a new light system, or in, put in a light system where none exists. And that light system will be coordinate with the Northfield and Main and the Main and State lights to create a, a better um, traffic flow through downtown. And we also have $250,000 for street lighting upgrades. This would convert downtown street lights to LED lighting. Uh, we, it would, has the benefit of saving us costs. Uh, it will pay for itself in about 19 years, as well as providing more steady lighting. It won't necessarily be brighter. But we're having some issues with um, sort of lighting outages. We have old lights and old circuits. And so um, this will just improve our lighting system downtown. Uh, we commissioned a net zero plan to look at city facilities and city vehicles. It recommended three, in, three uh, building projects, heating projects. And the first or the highest priority for the city was uh, replacing the pellet, replacing the heating system at the DPW garage with a, with a pellet heating system. So this proposes to do that project. Uh, again, uh, more efficient heat, uh, less not you know, taking us off of fossil fuels and providing renewable energy. And then finally, we have a, a slope failure on Marvin Street which is um, potentially undermining the road. So this would allow us to do a slope stabilization uh, of the soil and, and save that street. So those are the miscellaneous infrastructure grouping. And then lastly, uh, the biggest one, which I'm probably least capable of explaining, but fortunately uh, you've heard about this a lot in detail, but we have a 16.4 million for the water resource recovery fund upgrade. This would come from the sewer uh, plant. This is phase two of the overhaul project. Um, phase one modernized the plant to accept and process commercial food waste. Uh, and this resulted in e increased methane production and, and uh, significantly reduced energy costs and a much more modernized plant. Um, there are still some more upgrades to the plant left to become, but we also have uh, issues, uh, including increased odor to the point where the state has cited us to uh, address it. And also we have created methane and now we need to use it in a, in a good way. Uh, so our odor control technology is included in this proposal as is, and, and the key to this really is to dry the residuals known as biosolids or sludge. And uh, this is a major cost to us uh, to dispose of this at the landfill. Um, so it's by weight. So this will reduce the weight significantly, reduce those costs. And also because of its size, it will require a lot less trucking up to uh, Coventry uh, and saving those those trips. So there's uh, both a financial and environmental benefit to offset the costs of the, the bond. And there's a lot more to it than that. And I would defer that to those that are more expert if it, if it comes to that. Bill, could I add a comment here? Sure. I've gotten some 
input from people who live on State Street out by the cemetery who are very concerned about the health issue and that the community at large may not realize it's more than just a violation. It actually is the odors are a health issue, what's in them. And so they really, really want this bond to go through and they want people to understand it's really, really important. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, in, in addition to the city's budget in these proposals, there are three ballot items right now that we're aware of um, that are sort of independent of, of the city budget. Uh, the Kellogg Hubbard Library this year ballot item is 395,696. That's an increase of 45,225 from last year. Uh, we Central Vermont Public Safety Authority is $14,100 for the city's share. Uh, that is up 14,000 from last year. And Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice is 23.5, which is the same as last year. And all of those are already figured into our tax rate calculations, even though they're not ours. We, um, oops, come on. There we go. So where does that leave us? Uh, it, the uh, city's municipal tax rate would go from 1.18 cents to 1.26 cents, about uh, 8.1 cents or 6.8%. Um, it will not increase 9.7% as has been incorrectly uh, reported at the Front Porch Forum. Uh, so that is 7.4 cents from the city and 0 0.7 cents from the ballot items. Last year's budget, uh, our, our budget only increased the tax rate by 0.6%. So our 7.4 cents, that the average of 8.1 and, and 0.6, excuse me, it's 8.4, not 7.4. So it's 4.2% uh, over two years. And I'll, I'll straighten that number up. Um, I think I made a mistake there, so I'll get that correct. Um, there's no change estimated um, for the residential education tax rate. In fact, we've heard it may drop. Um, but until I hear that for sure, I'm not assuming that, but I am assuming that it's going to stay the same. So if it stays the same, the overall residential tax bill for everyone would increase 8.1 cents, and that's about 2.8% um, from last year for the, for the total tax bill. So that's the real impact on the taxpayer, and that doesn't count any uh, income sensitivity payments or circuit breaker and those kinds of things. So here's the time if there's any questions uh, about the overview, if there are specific questions. Uh, actually, we'll do this afterwards. And then just to wrap up, we have the public hearing this week, a public hearing next week, and then we'll start the normal early voting process as soon as ballots are ready and with everything voted on by March 1st and Tuesday. So with that, we'll. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'm going to do two things. First, I will also open the public hearing on the bond proposals. I think that, that it's probably easier to have them running concurrently than to try to separate people and commenting about the budget and commenting about the bond. So now we have two public hearings running at the same time. Sure. Um, do we have I may, any? I may go back up there because it might be easier for me addressing the people. OK. Do we have any questions from the council? Jay. Just a quick one in that bill, you were going to explain the change for the um, the uh, country club lot from 1.5 to 2 million. Yeah, we need to talk about that a little bit later tonight. Oh, later tonight. Um, but, okay, but I will say, generally, when we estimated, if you recall, the number we put in was an initial estimate of what we thought it might be. And we've yeah, since had priced. more. Right. We've yeah. had we've got an appraisal going, and we've had conversations with the property owner, and we've looked at. The other available resources, and we think that's a more accurate number. Um, okay. Yeah, so. Lauren. Uh, <laughs> um, one question I had was um, I really appreciated Justin Dreschler's idea earlier about looking at ways to um, help support the Afghan families moving to our community. Do you, 
based on the new guidance um, from Treasury about the American Rescue Plan Act funding, does it seem like there would be some flexibility in there to think creatively about how we might be able to do that? I do. Great. Okay, I'm gonna, go ahead. I just had one question. I got confused on your next to last slide we were talking about percentages, Bill. Mm -hmm. You have a correction is that, you know, 0.6% last year, and then right. you have 7.4. Yeah, so I, I, I forgot to correct that. That was before, that was done with our proposed budget, and I didn't correct it with the council. So it's gonna, it's a little bit higher than that. Okay. 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 Correct that. <clears throat> okay, we'll open it up to uh, comments from the public, and we'll go to people who are online first. I see uh, Jody Pedersen, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Hi, Jody Pedersen from Colonial Drive. So my first question is, does, do the voters get to vote on the bonds separately from the budget? Yes, there will be okay. city budget, the city budget, the school budget, those three ballot items, you know, the library and those things, and then four bond votes. Each of which are separate. Each, each of separate bond, not, so yeah, each bond will be a separate vote. And the second comment is about the $2 million for the rec, for the Elks Club. Um, seems like an awful lot of money for the residents of Montpelier to be putting forth for more rec, recreation area. Um, and I would really love to see that area end up getting developed, have put a couple other developments of nice housing or medium priced housing to find places for for people to be able to move to our city and and join us and add to our tax base. So I, I would much rather see a lot of that land go to a good developer to develop. Anyway, thank you. Okay, thank you, Joey. Um, at the moment, I do not see any other hands up uh, online. Up, oh, Dee Dee Brush, and then Peter Kelman. And Dee Dee, you appear to be muted. Excuse me, I'm sorry. There you um, go. I've been trying to read through the uh, budget that's on the uh, website. And just, you know, and your, your presentation just now, Bill, answered a few of the questions. Um, but when I looked at the line items and sort of the percentages of increases uh, in some of the city operations, I was struck by uh, one, it's called the total finance number. And it appears that it's gone up 20%. And I wondered if you could explain why, is that a software? expense why is it so high um well I'll let the finance director handle that if she if, if i get it wrong she's here i i can't hear you i'm sorry i'm, I'm sorry um i will let the finance director is here and if i get this wrong i will let her answer it however that is one of those areas where we held two positions vacant in last year's budget uh to in order to um meet our needs and as in as we're restoring the positions so some of that is an increase with new people and I, or not new people, but just filling positions that had been zeroed out last year because of COVID. Uh, that's the biggest thing. And then I think there is some technology in there as well. She's nodding her head. If there's anything else, um, but th those are the big things. Okay, and um, the question I had um, in a previous meeting a couple of weeks ago was, I think it might be the, um, I'm trying to see where it might have come in on your presentation. The net zero plan, is that $100,000? Is that the consultant that you would like to hire? Well, so the city council's, a, uh, yes, I guess, ultimately, uh, you know, the council has raised the issue of having a, a, a energy coordinator. Um, I think ultimately, you know, how those policies get determined, uh, I think it, as I've thought about it at least, there could be a lot of different ways to, to look at that. So we've we've sort of put in a hundred, 
We've allocated hundred thousand dollars to deal with net zero. Could be a full time position. Could be consultant work. Could be uh, actual improvements. Um, but it would likely be that coordinator position. In the, but in the same way as we have fifty thousand dollars for economic development, um, but we don't have it specifically assigned yet where it's going to go. It's saying this is a priority, and obviously we won't spend that money till the council approves a plan. So some of those numbers are projections because you don't have an, a solid number or a person in place necessarily correct and um so well, we have a, i mean we have a so i don't mean to interrupt you dd i'm sorry no, but, you okay. know we do have a pretty good idea of what things cost for professional people in certain fields um and a couple other things and i'm sorry i'm sort of nitpicking here but that's partly because i haven't done this my homework in previous years very well um you have thirty thousand for committee support how does that compare to last year? Do you know? That That is new. That is, um, and again, I think council members could explain this. The Social and Economic Justice Committee had recommended that we provide potential stipends for people who serve on committee in order to broaden, uh, to maybe get people with lower income or different backgrounds to, to help offset daycare costs and those kinds of things uh, to, to allow us to have a, a broader uh, group of people serving on city committees and so the council set aside a sum of money or has proposing to set aside a sum of money uh, to try a pilot program this year to see if that's um, see if that works um, and if you find that it does not result in greater participation is your intent to re-examine that and maybe drop it from next year's budget or the following year's budget I think how are you I'll, gonna, leave, how are you I think I'll leave that to the city council to answer. Um, I think that's I think that is what the plan is. Yes. I, I guess the question is how are you going to measure that? So before so uh, before we put the plan in place, we have had discussions about this. Um, we would put in some parameters about how we what we are, what the goals are and what we are looking at. Um, and again, this money isn't available till July first. So if this stays in the budget and the budget passes, we have between March and July to establish the program before we roll it out. Um, so speaking solely for myself and not for the city council who would ultimately approve it, my thought is it would be something like comparing number of applications, you know, looking at the diversity of applications, looking at uh, how we're seeing, if, if we're not seeing any different people and we're not seeing any increased numbers, then my take would be that it didn't work. If we're suddenly seeing a whole bunch of new applicants and people, you know, representing different communities than we've seen before, then it is work. But obviously, we need to we need to articulate that a little clearer than that. And the council may one hundred percent disagree with me on that. That's just my own opinion. And finally, and then I'll stop so others can speak. Um, how, where do you suppose the number came from that was reported that we were going to perhaps experience a nine point seven? increase in our taxes and you just reported that it's only going to be 2.8 how how is it so widely different um because the the overall budget city's budget is increased by 9.7 percent but it's also offset by revenue increases so there's so there's the city's portion of the budget and which is about 40 percent of the total tax rate so the city's budget is going up 9.7 percent tax portion of the city's budget is only going up 6.8%. The school's budget right now, we're calculating it's not gonna change at all, the, the tax. They're taking, saying it might actually go down, which means that 2%. So when you put it all together, the total tax bill would be about 2.8%. The city's portion of the tax bill would be 6.8%. Of Six just its um, Okay. So right, I know that's I, a lot of numbers, but I know okay. nine, there is a basis for 9.7%, but it's not a tax number. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Dee. Uh, Peter. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, I, Bill, I, I just, I just want to uh, compliment you in, in two ways. One is I thought that having a PowerPoint uh, was very, very helpful to, to citizens who are uh, to, well, listening and watching, and I, 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 I think that that PowerPoint was very well done, and I appreciate your attempt to tell us what the initials mean, uh, the acronyms. That's always bewildering to uh, many of us, and uh, uh, too many times 
in city council meetings, I, I hear initials go whizzing by. Um, I, I, I think that one of the things that you did or began to do that's important is to put the large items and the large uh, sections into an overall context. And I think that's very important for taxpayers. Um, I, I, I think we, there is still a communication gap if you drill down. Uh, Didi's questions, I think, are an example of that. Um, you know, and you may say, well, that's just a $30,000 item. But th it is important for us to understand what some of these line items mean. Um, and I, I, so I know that's a challenge because it, there's a lot of detail. But saying it's all on the website, the whole book is there, that doesn't quite do it for me. I think that I think we, we need to have a figure out a way that people can say, I don't understand. What is this? I mean, what is this hundred thousand? What is this thirty thousand dollars for? That's uh, for uh, for the website. What, what what are we talking about? What are you actually going to do for that? Um, I'm not. Sh I don't know the answer of how to do it, but I think it is is important to try to figure out ways, especially to explain new things. I think, for example, the way you explained the the State Street. Um, project was really good. I think everybody could envision that they could picture, you know, replacing the pipes and, you know, doing the pavement over and so on and so forth. But we, there's some, there's some, there's some black boxes in here. You know, a black box is where you see what goes in, you see what goes out, but you have no idea what's in the middle. And, and for voters, it's, it's important to know what goes on in the middle. That's just a suggestion. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Peter. If I could respond to that, um, just for your, to your question, but also anybody else who's listening, is um, I do try to call out anything that's new and different. Uh, obviously, there's a lot, and and you could spend a long time on each item. Uh, the the bridge articles that I do, uh, this the one that's coming out next week, uh, or maybe this week, will have the a full write up on all the bonds. The one that comes out the following week will have all the numbers on the budget, including issue you know itemization of all those items you talked about. So some of the things are, you know, you can provide a more detail, you know, in a more written form than you can just in a in an overview. It's sometimes just easier to answer the questions when when people have. So I appreciate it. it is a challenge, and we do try to get it out, particularly for something that's that's new and different. So and and uh, one last thing to the, actually two last things. One to the black box question. Projects like specific projects that are well defined are easy to describe. East State Street services and policy goals sometimes aren't so it's we're putting you know money to this because we're trying to accomplish a certain goal or we're trying to deliver a certain service and we don't know exactly how it's going to come out until we spend a little bit more time but what, what the council is saying is this is a high priority policy area for us we're going to put resources to it and we are going to to develop something so i can understand why some seems fuzzier than others I, I would just like to make one suggestion that those smaller items that are policy goals of the city council, I would suggest that city councilors make an effort to explain it to the people in their district. And that's the way you can begin to open up the black box at the, di at the district level. Have some district town meetings and let the people in your district ask you questions, especially for things that are you know, council babies. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. Um, next up, we have Holly. Yes, Holly Fowler. Hi there. Thank you, council. Thank you, city manager, for taking these questions. Um, I'm here wearing my hat as um, a representative of the Complete Streets Committee. And in studying the parking fund portion of the budget, it may be there. I may not have seen it. Um, whether or not uh, there was restored funding for this standing committee of the municipality, and it may not be there. I think I heard something earlier in the audit conversation about potentially level setting that. Um, and I think our committee is just curious uh, to know if there is a plan for restoring funding that previously flowed thanks to parking funds, or if we should be looking for it for someplace else or if we need to take action, basically. So thank you. Um, so to answer that question specifically, um, it's not in the parking fund. 
that's not to, because the parking fund, you know, really un, underperformed last couple Understood. of years. Understood. And, yep. and uh, we think we have the parking fund more stable. And as we go forward this year, if, if we can, if it starts showing a, a positive income, you know, we can set some aside, obviously, with the council's approval. So we're keeping our eye on that. Uh, and I think in terms of, in general, um, having, you know, the committee, we have processes, you heard, we outlined a whole bunch of projects that we're putting money towards and in specific projects probably ought to get into that queue as well as is that, that sum of money. So. Is there, is there special instruction for how a special project gets into the queue? Is there a process? Uh, yes, uh, typically when we, we put out a call for those sorts of things and we've actually been spending, um, We've been talking, this is more of an internal conversation, not for the council so much, but making sure we're clearly communicating with all the committees to, to, to know those deadlines, when to get projects submitted and and through themselves and through their, their committee staff and those kinds of things, just to make sure nothing gets missed. We've had a you know a couple of committees asking this question and we wanna make sure everyone has a chance to, to get their things into the mix. Okay, we will be listening and waiting. So thank you very much. Thanks, Holly. Uh, Phyllis Rubenstein. Thank you, uh, Phyllis Rubenstein from College Street. I am very impressed by the complex and detailed budget that's been presented. I do have a few comments and, and perhaps some of them at least will, well, I have a few comments and maybe a question. I do support the purchase of the property owned by, formerly owned by the Elks Club or known as the Elks Club for the purpose of uh, promoting recreation in, in Montpelier. Um, I think that that's a laudable goal and I hope that it does go forward. I have been a member of the Montpelier Conservation Commission for over three years. I have served on very many volunteer boards and committees and nonprofits during my adult career. And a volunteer does not expect to get paid. So I had listened to the budget discussions about from the last meeting about the, where the Social Justice Committee initially requested $42,000 to provide as $50 a meeting stipends to members of, of city commissions. That's one of the things I asked about. Stipend. Well, I, perhaps my word is stipend, and that wasn't the word that was used, but what I heard was that if you attended a meeting, you would get $50 per meeting. And I, I um, would like to see city monies used for the benefit of all city residents, and I'm concerned that even though it, it's a a positive goal to increase diversity on city committees and commissions. I'm concerned about um, who will make the decision as to whether a member of a committee or a commission is going to get paid $50. And um, I, I just, I, I don't think that it's a fair process. You know, I, for one, would not request any money. Um, and on the Montpelier Conservation Commission, there are a couple of people who have young children and they do struggle and the kids are in the background during Zoom meetings, but it, it all works out. And I understand that the goal is to increase diversity, but I, I just question whether this is the, the right way to do it. Um, the other uh, budget, item that I had questions about, which has been discussed, but the $100,000 for the um, net zero plan, which I had heard at the last meeting was to pay for an energy consultant. And it seems like a lot of money when, although someone, perhaps it was Bill said that uh, that's the salary that someone in that position would require. But if there's never been anyone in that position, it seems like it's a big jump to go from no position to paying someone $100,000, especially when the 
um, average income of Montpelier residents is nowhere close to that. So these are very small items and I do appreciate your considering my opinions. And if anyone has any responses, I uh, uh, enjoy hearing them. Um, before anyone responds to your policy issues, Phyllis, just for your benefit and everyone else, when we talk about $100,000, that's all in for an employee that includes benefit costs and office space and th those kind of things. It wouldn't necessarily, you know, so this, the actual salary would probably be more like 70 some odd thousand with everything else on top of it. So it's a total package for an employee. I just want to be clear. I think some, that, that, so when we say 100,000, that's about what it costs us for a full-time professional position, all in. Okay, and, and that does make sense. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to cover the first part? The policy part? Uh, no, the, um, <laughs> uh, the, stipend. the stipend piece. <laughs> so, so Phyllis, that, that was part of our uh, early our conversation at our last meeting about what this pilot project would look like. And um, exactly to your point that this would be a um, uh, would be vo would be voluntary sort of no questions asked um, process where folks could if they were involved in a committee could um, uh, could request the funds it, it would not just be a blanket everybody who shows up for a meeting gets paid that stipend and you know I raised this point with Kelly and 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 you know and Bill at the same time and you know the city does not want to be in the business of trying to verify income or or you know, trying to justify this type of expenditure. The idea is that it's a um, uh, easy process that some that it would open up the doors and make more accessible. We have so many committees in the city and we, we engage with folks and we want to continue to and expand the engagement we have with with our community here and the broader base of and the more people that have access to be able to be involved in decision making in the city will only benefit us. So going into it sort of with a, um, you know, what, what's the term I'm looking for here, just with a, um, like, with a sense of trust that, that we would, no questions asked, that if, if you need that support, that you, it's available for you, but if someone like you would not need it, that you wouldn't necessarily get it, but that it would be available to folks who would need it that would make that, um, that would make all of the, all of the work of the of the city and volunteers that are to participate in the in our processes more accessible. So that's sort of a long winded way of saying that um, we would not be making people fill out forms and like justify their income to be able to get the stipend, but that it would be available to them if they needed it. I'd also like to add um, that it's um, lower barriers for people um, that wouldn't necessarily think coming to a meeting or being on a committee would be possible for them because of finances. Okay. Yep. Yes. And, and just, I mean, it came up a few minutes ago, the way we've been talking about it is as a pilot project where we would want to be assessing, is it working? I think you're raising really good questions about, you know, how is this going to play out? And is it actually increasing, um, you know, access and diversity and and those are questions we very much um, want to structure the program um, to assess um, and so I you know I don't think it's something that we would plan to do in perpetuity if it's not proving successful um, it was the um, a major recommendation of the city's equity assessment it sounds like you you watched the last meeting which I thank you for doing that so you probably got a lot of this context but um, this was one of the top recommendations that um, our professional equity consultants had made. Um, so, but I, I think they're great questions and are part of the shaping of how do we roll this out and try it and see if it's um, really benefiting the city and if it's something that we would therefore want to continue. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Phyllis. Right. Um, <laughs> okay. Now, uh, Vicki Lane. Um, Yes, um, I have to say that I do agree with Phyllis in that um, volunteering for a committee assignment or whatever is volunteering. Um, those of us that do tremendous amounts of volunteer work um, don't do it without expectation of, of any kind of remuneration 
even for you know gas that we spend going to and from um even those of us like me who don't have much money at all um so and and i also really am i really have trouble with the hundred thousand dollars uh as well as the thirty thousand dollars i also have a question um about the positions um which maybe i'm not following correctly um those positions i think you said bill in the finance department that were there but are not and you're putting them back are those positions positions that are currently held by someone or would those be new hires they're, they're now held they're now filled so the per people have been working without pay for the last <laughs> No, in last year's budget, they were we we froze them, and as revenues came in, we we need we've hired people based on our current situation. Now we're budgeting it fully for next year, so we froze positions based on our revenue situation. But there are but if you froze the positions and the people were still working, no. So at the time they were frozen, there weren't people working. Oh. Uh, so we had six positions that we froze citywide, okay. and then over the course of the year based on our financial position and based on specific needs, we've been able to bring some of them back. Because I was going to say, do we really, if they're not being, if they're right. not filled, do we really need them? But if they're filled, I guess we do need to they're pay filled them. filled and we do need them, yes. We were definitely- We do need to pay them. the people if they're well, working. And, and they're doing work that's necessary. Okay. Um, I also uh, support the, um, I can't believe I'm saying this, <laughs> that I'm supporting a $2 million potential, um, but the, the, the Elks Club thing. Um, I kind of would rather see the city do something with it and have it remain somewhat wild as a rec type field or recreation area, than have a developer come in and um, put expensive houses or condos or whatever up there. And I don't think we can demand, uh, you know, I don't think we can tell a, a developer that purchases the land what they can and can't build there as far as houses. Um, so I, I just, I would like to see some of that land stay natural. Um, as natural as it can, I know that we would be giving up tax revenues for any houses that are there, but I don't know. Anyway, thank you. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, Jean Leon. Hi, good evening, Jean Leon, Berlin Street. I just have, so this just, the first time I've, I've heard of this, I, I, I was a member at the Elks Club. Um, and I know it changed. Is this something the city's looking into purchasing? Is or is this on the table already? I, I maybe I missed. I've been out of the loop for for a couple of years, considering the the situation um, with the pandemic. And um, so I, I just had I had some comments, but I had, I just because this just came up, I just had that question on the Elks Club. I mean, because I mean, there'd be a significant amount of maintenance for the city if, if, if that was the case. So, uh, Gene, thanks for that question. The city will be purchasing the property. We've been looking for a location to develop a new recreation center. We wouldn't, I'm sure we wouldn't operate it as a golf course and in its current state. Um, and I think it, it creates a whole lot of opportunities for future fields. There's a lot of people that are interested in doing various recreational things there. Um, and we would be planning all the potential uses there. So yes, there would be maintenance, but uh, any recreational facility would have those costs and maintenance, but those are those are decisions to be made in the future. But the, right. land is, and the, is that the land's available now, and it's an opportunity for the city to control a major piece and, and direct its future. Uh, we don't have a recreation crisis. We have a housing crisis. We have a um, affordable housing crisis. 
Anyway, I, I, I look, I just can't emphasize enough the importance of, of responsible budgeting and, and especially with a social and economic consideration and the effort to reduce rather than increase our taxes, however necessary in, in the most creative ways that you could come up with. I know I, I like this idea of this pilot program because I mean, even as a council, you guys, you know, it is voluntary, even though the compensation is minimal, but it, it's it's like having two full-time jobs on top of the other jobs that you guys uphold. So, I mean, just from the feedback that I get as not only a CAN member, um, you know, running for office two years ago and, and, and just being involved in, in my neighborhood and other neighborhoods and community and, and just being out there, I mean, residents get fed up and, and they're frustrated with the, the systemic uh, way of governing things in, in the city of Montpelier, especially with tax increase. And so people do feel misrepresented or misguided. And, and I know things are out there and things are posted and things, but the, the communication has to improve. It's essential. And yes, the website is difficult to navigate. It took me a minute just to get on here. And it took me another minute, you know, to, to find the whole budget thing. And it's outdated. It's completely outdated. The hours are off. It's, it's hard to navigate through there. And so there has to be efforts to improve public engagement and dialogue. It's super essential. The bridge, I know you put things on the bridge, but by the time more information comes out, the bridge is out, you know, gets outdated. It's every two weeks. So it's not a, it's not per se a city um, newsletter that gets updated and that's friendly and easy to navigate. Um, anyway, I, I wish you all the best. Um, as another, as in another note uh, in Montpelier, I don't think we need to add onto the budget another, an energy consultant, in my opinion. Uh, we have many energy professionals in this city that would be more than happy to advise. Anyway, have a good night. I, I, I look forward to this uh, conversation further. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Jean. Uh, Kate Stevenson. Hi, I'll just jump in right on that comment. Um, Perfect so my name is Kate Stevenson. I'm a member of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. And you're right, Jean, that there are lots of talented energy professionals in Montpelier that can help out. That's what the Energy Advisory Committee is for. Um, and we are have been asking for, for multiple years for a staff position within the city to support the city's net zero goal, because there is just a point where volunteers um, can't do it all and to the level that we really need to accomplish the goals to for the municipality to be net zero by 2030. So um, this position, you know, a, a position was approved by the council in 2018. Um, it was not filled. Um, here we are, we're, we're doing FY23 budget. And, um, you know, I think I, my personal hope is that we can fill, a, create a staff position, that it's not just the consultant that comes in and, and leaves, but that we can create an ongoing presence to support these projects. It's, you know, I, I've sent to Bill and the other council members, you know, a list of the types of things that this could support, but it's basically, you know, project management in a lot of cases, it's tracking all of our energy metrics for the city, which is something I've been doing as a volunteer for five years. And, you know, we need some additional support to really be able to do that well. Um, it's managing the city's net zero revolving loan fund. Um, you know, there, there is a, a long list of, of things that are not necessarily happening or happening only just a little bit with, with volunteer support. So um, that's what, you know, so I, I definitely support the $100,000 being in the budget this year and on an ongoing basis 
um, so that the city can really reach its net zero goal. Thanks. I would point out that uh, Councillor Hurl uh, engaged in a conversation with Kate Stevenson about the kinds of things that the uh, energy uh, specialists could do, and that's that's in an email, which of course is a public document. Uh, maybe we could put that on the web city's web page so people can see in more detail the kinds of things we're talking about. Thanks, Kate. Uh, Dee Dee Brush again. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would like to second the um, concept or the idea that was proposed tonight, I think it by Peter Clayman. Uh, I don't feel that the council members have done quite enough to inform us as a district uh, or members of a district about the priorities of the city and what they believe is important in this budget or in any other budget. I think it would be a terrific idea if we could um, encourage some community um, gatherings. And I realize that that's difficult during the pandemic, but it can be, I mean, we're all pretty used to Zoom by now. So perhaps on Zoom uh, between now and when we are supposed to be voting for these um, items, and even though many of these things are, you know, 30,000 here, 100,000 there, 25, et cetera, they do add up. And Montpelier doesn't ever seem to vote a budget down. And I think it's partly because we don't get enough information. Um, and we don't have the expertise to um, burrow our way through many of the documents that you all have access to and, and discuss and debate on a um, weekly basis or bi-weekly basis. So I would encourage more of that if possible between now and our the vote. And um, I also just wanted to say, I hope you're listening to these comments and that you don't just dis discard them and assume that you can move forward with um, what you've already proposed without careful thought. Um, that's my hope. And that's why I had decided to try to participate because I, I hope it makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter Kelman. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd like to comment on um, this uh, unfortunate dichotomy recreation versus housing. This is not a zero sum game. It's not a zero sum game at the Elks Club. It's not a zero sum game in Montpelier. We can have both. And I think that there needs to be some creative thinking as the Elks Club prep a purchase becomes more likely about the possibility of having some mixed income housing up there as well as uh, recreation, as well as natural uh, space. Um, I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to hear the Habitat for Humanity idea for the former Gould Farm. It's a, it's a 50, 60 acre uh, parcel up uh, off of uh, Northfield Street. And that would be a combination of trails and affordable housing and maybe even some some expensive housing. Um, uh, but we, we just have to not be uh, sort of saying it's either this or that. So I, I, I and I hope we do that more. Um, I, I admit I was a little dismayed about talking about adding on to Hubbard Park. Um, I understand people who like to walk their dogs and so forth, but Hubbard Park's a pretty big place, and it seems to be a place where those very same people don't want homeless people to be camping. Well, that kind of disturbs me. We're going to spend more money on getting more Hubbard Park space, but we, we're not going to be doing stuff for, for home, homeless people. It's not either or. Let's think about these things together. If the Parks Commission wants to expand Hubbard Park, maybe the Parks Commission should be a little more generous about people camping in the woods, as an example. I'm not, I don't want to get off on that, but 
let's get away from this either or thinking, please. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. He's very involved. I'm not seeing anyone else's hand up uh, on Zoom for now. Is it, I'll see if there's anyone, a member of the public who uh, is in the room who would like to be heard. <clears throat> So I did take the time to spend several hours going through the budget book. Um, I'm concerned that the, with the best of intentions, uh, this budget is a product of a dysfunctional uh, relationship between the council and the management. The management has rolled this thing and, and facilitated a relationship where the council uh, rubber stamps a lot of stuff. So this process of we're going through the motions of public engagement by we shouldn't have canceled the February 5th meeting. You should have had this presentation as a way to inform and engage the public to then come to public hearings. So instead, it's like 930 and we're everybody's tired and ready to go home. And now that you got a lot of detail to have to deal with or ignore as you see fit. Um, the, the, the access to the information, other people have made that point, is, is miserably deficient. Um, it wasn't in my case because I came to City Hall and knew how to, who, who to ask to get access to it. Um, I mentioned the website ad nauseum that needs to be replaced with a new, you know, the home homepage of the website now has a survey, new survey on the budget. And you click on it, it's like, oh, that survey goes to Survey Monkey. That survey is closed, expired. I'm like, who's maintaining this website? It's just another egregious example. Uh, I don't know where the TIF did. I heard tonight that they're they're trying to borrow the money to pay the million dollars of the garage fiasco? Is that what I heard? The city approved a bond to pay for the garage uh, for up to $10.5 million. So we're gonna let 1.1 million of that bond to pay. That's always been the plan. That was made very clear to people that that was gonna be what happened. But you, you, but you can't use the bond money to pay for a, a boondoggle uh, yes. architect debt. You can? Yes. Oh God. It's worse than I thought. Actually, um, that was what was very clearly communicated in advance what would happen. So we'll basically, I, as much as that looks like a conflict of interest, I'd like support the commenter before me saying, you need to inform the people with enough detail to where they could start voting down these budgets. You know, And that's not what's going on right now. Um, the vision statement. Well, I can applaud it. I have to say that we're not living up to it. You know, we're, we're environmental protection. For years, I keep telling you that all the trash along the riverbank and all the clothes and all the homelessness garbage and, and the mattresses, and, and we don't clean it up. We, we let it wash down when the high water comes. So we can't pretend that we're doing this environmental protection while we <laughs> fail to do this. Every time I get to go to Donna Barlow, it's like there's no staff, there's no money. We're not going to take care of any of this stuff. You know, it, it's really atrocious. Um, the salt, I've mentioned forever that we don't sweep the sidewalks, we don't sweep the streets properly. We make a half assed effort at it. And then all that blows across into people's food and into the farmer's market. You know, we, that's toxic stuff. That's, that's antifreeze and oil and salt. And, and I've suggested we get a vacuum cleaner. That would have been a perfect use of ARPA funds and pay somebody, pay one of these homeless folks to wander, drive around, walk around town with a vacuum cleaner and keep the city clean. But it didn't even make it into the budget discussion. So this, there's a state statute that requires the finance management department to engage with the public in the budget development process, not try to rubber stamp it or, or take it apart in the last stages. I think this city should give some thought to that. Um, ensuring strong municipal services. 
uh, like the website and and uh, uh, picking up the garbage. I pointed out and I sent videos to Donna of eight inches of water in Elm Street because we don't bother to clean our drains for ye four years now. I've been telling you that the storm the, the storm drains are not set to the crosswalks. The crosswalks are filling with water and freezing, and now we're even still planting new trees and building new sidewalks that puddle in the middle of the sidewalk. It's the, the, the you get the, you get the, mis, can you spell mismanagement? Um, dignity for all is recognized and respected. The city is transparent and accountable in a highly ethical manner. I mean, this is fluff. This is fluff. This is not what we're doing. And this amount of money, this bloated budget is not going to, you know, implement these these high ideals. So a shit cake dryer for $16 million. We've got we got methane we're trying to get rid of, and we're gonna buy a pellet stove. It, it doesn't seem to add up, you know? And yet our entire engineering team seems to be consumed by this treatment plant rather than actually fixing the sidewalks. The people are tripping over the hazards. They're breaking their cars with the curves that are, you know, 14 inches above the pavement. You know, we're not, and there's no plan. I've asked, I've made public records requests. There's no plan to get these, these infrastructure issues addressed. There's a little, we're gonna chip away at it and we're gonna do a little window dressing over here. But, you know, 60,000 for sidewalks, that's a couple hundred feet. You know, it's it's just it's it's outrageous. But you know, we're we're doing a lot of feel good projects that we can brag about and say we're so modern and progressive. But you're spending like a drunken sailor, and you're reckless like a you know teenager spending people's money that you're not accountable for. The police consoles, three hundred fifty four hundred thousand dollars. Those. I've talked to some experts in this radio technology and the Motorola consoles that have been proposed to be bought should not be bought. They are not the least expensive and most cost effective until we get a complete design done. Televate was supposed to be the needs assessment. It was supposed to be followed by an engineered design. That engineered design has not been done. Current leadership doesn't want to do an engineered design. So, the, the radios, there's hundreds, there's thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars in those deferred equipment expenses that have been put in unbeknownst to most of you in prior years, police radios, police vehicle radios, et cetera. There's, there's a proposal to switch to first net with no analysis or, or measuring of where the coverage is better or worse than, than Verizon's. We know that AT&T lied to the state about where they had coverage. They also lied to the police chief about how priority and preemption works on an LTE network, but there's no expertise or due diligence there to, to untangle that, you know? So the, the body cam should move forward, but you need the oversight. You need the police review commission or its next iteration with authority to make sure that these decisions are made. I've told you, I've given you the example that finding a way to turn on a smartphone to make recording. I just learned, I, I heard tonight, I'm not sure I believe it, that we, the cruiser cam from the Mark Johnson shooting showed the drive down the street. The, the, rate, the cruiser cam from the grader hitting a car on Elm Street that I told you about last week does not show anything of the arrival. Could we uh, focus on the budget, please? This is about budget. This is about, in, you've got hidden in the budget technology purchases for the police that have not been properly designed or vetted. The police radios, the consoles, uh, and, and, and others, uh, and, and cameras. So that's why it relates to the budget. You're, 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 you're proposing to spend money without having done the due diligence of planning spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on consoles that aren't the best thing because the plans that they are designed to integrate into have not been done, you know? And to get to hear you on the bandwagon of like pull Montpelier out of the public safety authority, that's just so uh, typical, you know? Oh, 
Oh. Now we've had a lo long presentation. Uh, if you've you've gone uh, way over time, can you? Can no, you, I haven't gone any over time to up? many of the people who spoke tonight. I think I think you have, but I'd like to hear if you could uh, bring this to a conclusion. Could you please pull your mask up over your nose? Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Can Replacement you of failing meters. Uh, are we replacing them with meters that that are only available to people with smartphones? Or are we replacing them with meters that people can put coins in? And who's overseeing that process? Right now, they're sticking labels and tape over phones and saying, you can't use these meters anymore unless you're a smartphone customer, you know? And, and who's, who's responsible for that level of planning and accessibility and equal opportunity that's all in our vision statement, right? A redemption center, the folks that, that are now living at the uh, Girton Park in its new location, brilliant piece of work, uh, point out that what capital city in the country doesn't have a place where the people who deserve the dignity and the equal protection don't have a place to go cash in a few nickels, you know? Was that intentional to just disband the M&M &M and not make provisions for supplementing it with some uh, Alternate, I've mentioned the no oversight of the deadly mistakes and the uh, life-threatening mistakes in the uh, dispatch. The housing, housing task force gets $110,000. Homelessness task force get 45,000. That's the housing trust fund. Oh, it said- No, yeah, no, no money is appropriated to the housing task force so that's an error in the budget document but if, uh, that's okay okay that's uh, that's better that's that's first good news i've heard uh i aim to please sure you do okay we will be digging out of this infrastructure and maintenance deficit for decades once the current management is let go so we we need to you need to start this process of really investigating the chronic history of failures before you renew the manager's contract in March. Well, I just encourage you to think about the uh, the inconsistency of what you've said tonight. And I'm not going to ask you to respond tonight, but uh, you've been referring to this as a bloated budget, and yet almost every substantive comment you've made about the budget has been things that you think we're not spending enough money on well so, i can tell you where we're spending too much 138,000 139,000 for a city manager plus dental plus medical plus retirement plus telephone plus parking plus 10,000 for conferences this guy's costing us $200,000 a year and he's screwing up most of the projects he takes on okay thank you um Vicki Lane, you've already spoken twice, so can you keep it brief? Yes. Um, I really uh, would appreciate it if uh, statements did not single out people. And I really think that all of our employees and volunteers, and that includes the council because you basically volunteer, um, have the best interests of the city of Montpelier and its residents at heart. I don't always agree with them. And, you know, I don't always agree with everything that's done, but I don't think anybody has in their hearts the desire to screw this city over. And I, I really would appreciate less comments about how horrible somebody thinks somebody is. Um, Thanks, Becky. I appreciate that. I, um, I think, I think this. If the last two years have proved nothing, it's proven that we can be really nasty to each other, and we need to really work on that. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone on the council have anything to say at this point? Donna. I would like to say, and I was really glad to hear many people comment about housing. 
and I'm sorry that they missed some of our initial discussion about purchasing the Elks Club land and looking at that as having the city to control it and looking at possibilities of housing, making it not only just the rec center and outdoor recreation, but really being holistic about it. But we can't do that without owning it. When we own it, then we can turn it into something that gives us tax revenue, as well as a lot of quality out time recreation and buildings that will give us inside recreation because here was here is where we live and not everybody can deal with the winters <laughs> or the hot hot weather we need to go inside sometimes to recreate so i was really glad to see those kind of comments because we are thinking that way about this land thank you i think that's a great point and another thing to keep in mind is if we develop a new recreation center somewhere other than barry street there's another building that potentially could be put to other uses. Um, so I guess at this point, oh, Jean Leon, you have your hand up now. Again, uh, if we could make it, make it fairly brief. Sorry, just, just on a brief, quick on, on this comment. Um, so based on the last Donna's comment, I mean, I agree this is the, the Potential is phenomenal, and the mixed use idea would be fabulous. But how about where the M and M Redemption Center was? Is, well, how about the use of that space that's ours, or partially states, partially city, now abandoned, now with a shed, now with issues? Thank you. Thanks. At this point, oh, Connor. Yeah, no, I just, I just want to uh, take a minute and thank everybody for their comments tonight, and uh, it, just to let folks at home know, we, you know, we, we don't make these decisions lightly, and uh, we, you know, we understand asking folks to contribute a bit more. Um, you know, it, it takes a toll on, on everybody, um, but you know, I, I sort of regret the idea that we can't have a more progressive form of taxation in our limited municipal government. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, as we've noted, uh, we, we, we see a lot of our neighbors fall into the cracks here, especially during the pandemic, you know, when the, when the homelessness uh, camping policy came up, we, we had 50 people here saying we got to do more, you know, we got to do more. And, and we hope, you know, that between the $425,000 investment uh, in ARPA for a future um, hub there uh, and, and dedicating resources to, you know, social worker, peer outreach. We're at least beginning to like scratch the surface here of trying to help people get the, the help they need. You know, we, we hear a lot about roads. There's substantial uh, investments into our infrastructure here uh, to, to make sure you know there's there's less flat tires on the roads and and that people don't trip on the sidewalks. Uh, investments in ADA, these things are so important. Um, and it, it's been said, you know, the rec center we had three options. It's we could have gone to the rec fields out of the Elks Club or the out of the Elm Street there. Uh, we didn't think there was the room and didn't want to sacrifice the space for some of the other fields. We could have invested in the existing building, but, you know, it, it's, it's past its expiration date and it would take substantial investment uh, to, to bring it up to speed. And it, it's better to have options, better to take a fresh look at this. Um, so, again, I, I think a lot of these increases did come as a result of a, a robust public uh, input uh, from, from the town here. Uh, as Kate said, with the Energy Advisory Committee, we, we rely on our committee so much, these volunteers. Uh, and, you know, all these years of, of saying we'll get to, you know, net zero, we need to put some investment behind that to actually make it work. Otherwise, we're just having a conversation with ourselves. So uh, reasonable people can disagree on this. I appreciate Vicky's comments about being civil to each other. We're all neighbors here. You know, we're paying the taxes as well. Um, but I, I really appreciate just the, the thoughtful comments tonight from, from everybody in the audience. So thanks very much. So now I think it's time to close the public hearing and then for the council to take action on, uh, on these ballot or budget agenda items. So that's, that's the yeah, sequence, so you, right? You may take action there, there if you choose to direct us to change anything before next week's meeting for the second public hearing, then this would be the time to do that. Um, you also, we'll have the opportunity to make changes after the second public hearing. And um, so, okay, so both the budget and the bond public hearings are now closed. Um, 
Folks, what do we want to do? I go ahead. Oh no. Oh. Breathing. <laughs> I haven't been breathing. Yeah. I apologize for my not breathing well, everybody. <laughs> Beyond your control, I would say. Do we need a motion to move what was proposed this evening onto the next public hearing? Is that you don't need any motion process? if nothing's going to change? Or if you want to change. Like it, one question, I think, for Bill, and then happy to just share my overall thoughts and. I, just echo the appreciation, really thoughtful comments and input tonight and from the hearing from the community in the last month or so. Um, my question, so just tied to the ARPA money, which because that would not be increasing the tax rate, like did anything jump out at you with the new guidance as something that could be a natural fit to so move we there? We have looked at that. Um, so, the, you know, it's still one-time money, so we wouldn't want to put program ongoing expenses into it. So it would be moving probably capital or equipment, you know, from our capital improvement budget into the ARPA program, which just reduces. So that means next year that's got a bigger jump as well, which, you know, that, that's a choice. Um, but that would really be the only way that would really be the only place to take it from or any other, you know, any of the old, sort of one time kind of expenses. So it's it's not impossible. You know, we could and, and we've been thinking about it. And, and since we heard that there was going to be a change in the ARPA requirements, um, my first question to Kelly was, what could we what could we do to reduce the taxes? Um, and we kicked it around with our team, but it's just, you know, moving one thing around so you know maybe it's an opportunity to have more flexibility to do some of the things we'd like to do in the future or you know put it toward you know some of these things so. thanks thanks for that yeah yeah and if you know any epiphanies come up <laughs> before next right. week we still have another chance um yeah i mean i i i guess just to share my thoughts for a minute you know, I mean, I, I really have struggled with this some. I mean, I really hear and appreciate and feel the concerns about increasing taxes at a time when costs for everything are going up. And I know that all of us on council have wrestled with that. And at the same time, knowing that, you know, week after week in here, we hear about these increasing needs. We've had to put so much on the back burner and on hold We've had to, you know, and we've seen the impacts from our roads and just the human crises that are happening right now and the urgency of needs that are coming in and where the state is not stepping up to address human needs the way that I think they should. So more and more is falling on the city. So, you know, I, I think it's there's so many obligations and so much kind of backfill from a couple of years of a pandemic that you know, to me, you know, I've I wrestled with it. And I think this is a kind of investment that we we need to make, we need to catch up. And I think this is really looking at some of these systemic issues. So instead of being in crisis mode year after year, let's actually try to address housing. Let's, you know, so that we're not just trying to do band-aids for unhoused people in our community. Like let's actually, you know, invest a little in an energy position and then we can actually save money for the community over the long term by having a more efficient and clean energy um, you know so there's all these opportunities where if we can make strategic investments it costs something now but i i really see it as a long-term investment that's going to set us up where the people in our community and our overall city government is going to be more effective and helping all of us thrive i think also at this particular moment with so much federal money at the state level, us being as well positioned as possible to take what could be some really transformative investments. We need to be ready. We need to have the staff that can actually jump on those opportunities, identify them and take full advantage. And I think, you know, having full staffing, 
Um, and these kinds of investments right now are, you know, how can we look at this as a moment to make generational investments in our community? And so I think, you know, I, I understand and I really feel <laughs> the, the concerns that I've heard about increasing taxes right now. And, you know, I, I, this is where I'm landing for now. We've got one more week, but <laughs> this, I, I really think it's responsible to try to actually look at the systemic issues and make investments instead of just continuing to put band-aids and underfund things and keep operating in crisis mode. I agree. I think that this has been uh, <clears throat> a very transparent and very open public process. We've had uh, this as one of the first two public hearings. We've had the budget workshops. We've heard uh, last month, we've heard from a lot of, uh, of residents and it's, we have tremendous needs in the city and we made responsible decisions at the uh, beginning of the pandemic. And it's been, those are decisions that <clears throat> involved cutting back on, on services that were important services at the time and people have paid for it. I, every one of us has heard from people say, well, the roads are falling apart. They're bad for our cars. And we know what it takes to, uh, to fix the roads. It's devoting the money to, <laughs> to fix it. And, and we're putting uh, money in that. We've heard complaints about the uh, city's webpage and uh, how it's not uh, what any, anyone wants to see. We've got money in here for that. We've got money in this budget for a lot of, uh, of things that are really important needs, not only keeping the baseline operations of the city running, but also, as, uh, as you said, keeping you know, making some really big generational investments at a time when we have the ability to do that. So I'm not inclined to change this between now and the next public hearing. We'll see what we hear at the next public hearing, but I'm satisfied with where we are for right now. It did occur to me that um, you, you don't have to do this tonight, but if we were to change um, the amount of the bond for the rec center, that would require, you know, you've approved the 1.5 million. If you want to hear more about that before you do that, that's, that's fine. Um, but I yeah. don't want to lose track of that. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about because we've got that discussion later. I can wait till next week as well. Yeah. Okay. So that takes care of items 13 and 14 on the agenda. And we decided we were putting item 15 right to the, or item 16 right to the end. So that brings us to item 15, uh, COVID-19 response and open meeting requirements. Is that, uh, is that Bill or? I think that's okay. Donna. You asked to have this put on. I did. I was wondering, I would feel more comfortable if the council decided that we all were remote and that indeed with the guidelines now we still would have to have staff in person and and I really want to protect the staff who has to be here. So I suggested the staff be in this room and the public be in that room and they can see the screen so that we're really trying to take full space of this very very uh, contagious virus that's now going so that's why i asked it to be put on the agenda because it's to me the council as a group works better if we're all remote or we're all here and that's where i'm at and so when you say this room and that room are you thinking we would close off the no uh, no it'd be open just increase the space you know I see. just okay. less chance to travel i mean if i'm i don't want to be here because of it i don't want the staff who has to be here to be any more exposed than they have to be. Gotcha. Cameron, you were raising your hand. You don't want to be here at all. No, <laughs> that's what I was about to say. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Cameron Niedermeyer, the assistant city manager. I just wanted to um, make sure we, you knew that we were watching um, the bill. I think it's 222 that just went out. Um, I think both the House and the Senate have voted on it at this point. But that is that bill is proposing to bring us back to where we were at the beginning of the pandemic, where it doesn't require a physical location and everything can be purely on Zoom again. 
Um, Y'all can decide to go fully remote at any time. We'll be here, but that we're hoping. I mean, well, Me too. I'll speak for myself on that one. <laughs> I am hoping. I, you know, I've had COVID before, and I'm really not interested in getting it again. So um, that might be a requirement. Or that might change really soon. And just so you know, we are watching that, and we'll let you know as soon as that if that passes. Thanks. Um, right. This would be something in the interim. I guess. I'll take comments from everyone else. I guess where I'm, what I'm coming from is with regard to going full remote with nobody physical pre physically present. You know that really concerns me because uh, there are people who don't have the uh, ability to participate remotely, and I I want to keep the uh, the building open for those who can only participate by coming in person. And from my personal view, I also want to be here in person because I think the quality of the interaction is is better in person than uh, than remotely. I think Don is right that all remote or all in person is better than hybrid. And I just still feel pretty strongly that we should be in person, but that's my own opinion. Anyone else have anything to say about this? I have very bad asthma, as you've noticed tonight, and I am really not interested in getting sick. Um, and I had posed this question to Donna because I was sick and under quarantine last week. So I didn't think, I thought I had COVID. <laughs> um, so I would feel more comfortable and safer being remote, but that's being so super selfish right now. Anyone else have any, any thoughts? I just can't hear people. I would have to be telling Bill and, and Jack all the time, speak up, speak up. I just give up. I can't hear things with the mask. It makes a huge difference. Um, <laughs> so if I stay, you're going to hear me say that a lot. That's <laughs> fine. But it fine. is a real issue. I, uh, I hate Zoom so much. <laughs> so much. I, I see the bloody squares of my sleep. And, uh, and I, I do kind of agree with Jack. I, I don't think it's as conducive to a good discussion um, as being in person. That said, you know, if there are colleagues and staff who, you know, do, do feel vulnerable, and, you know, I, I do not want people coming to these meetings in fear, and, and I would go with the flow and go back to the. Brady Bunch, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you feel that way, I watch that. I mean, I'm fine with being here, but if we all consented to not be here, I would be really excited. And it is true that anybody could decide to be home and participate remotely, but you're, I think you're right. It's not, it's not as good. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of agree with everyone on different <laughs> aspects. Um, I mean, part of me is like, we should do, I feel like, like the budget discussion next week, like maybe do one more in person because that is just such an important meeting and getting every detail right and being able to have as good a conversation. And then maybe after that, we you know, assuming if we're still at like record breaking cases and that we could do, you know, try a Zoom meeting. And if we're like, oh, it's horrible, <laughs> we, we could always come back. Um, but I, I mean, I think if people are feeling at some risk and that it's, I, I'm comfortable going back to Zoom, I would just think maybe just next week one more even though it's like right in the worst this is what i'm struggling with <laughs> okay so why don't we revisit it after our meeting at our meeting next week and see how things look or are you are you actually making a formal proposal to say go all remote once uh, the budget's done I, I think that's where i'll be inclined even though i also passionately hate zoom um and spent all day on it and don't want to, but, um, but I do think for 
you know, our February meetings, we could probably do it. And um, if we're still at this and could reassess if, you know, cases are starting to dip and the circumstances seem to change, but that would be my, I guess what I would be supporting next week, unless something changes. And I'm open to doing next week remote too, if other people feel really strongly, it just, just knowing the importance of getting the budget right. I, I don't know if there's some benefit to one more. Yeah, I, I would agree. Let's, I, I think that if we re let's have this conversation again at the, at the end of our next meeting and look at those, finish up the budget and then look at going remote from there because I, sh I share a hatred of, of Zoom, but at the same time, <laughs> if, if folk, I mean, who, who, yeah, at the same time though, if, if anybody's not comfortable, then I am all for, I will, I will deal and we'll go remote and we'll, we'll do our best. I do agree 100% that it's sort of all in or all out. Like if we're half up here and half, like that's just gonna, not gonna be conducive to any type of uh, communication. So let's at our next meeting then decide and um, if, if, we, if that's the decision, then, then we can go back to, to the Brady Bunch. Okay. <laughs> Steven, do you have a quick comment? Yeah, uh, the air cleaners, uh, the air cleaners are very effective and they make it possible for this higher quality interaction. Um, our system here leaves a lot to be desired. And, and I've talked to Orca, this improving this such that such an interaction, such as Donna proposed, having the public further away and having the staff up here, even that's going to require improvements to the microphones. Bill's microphone especially is boomy, 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 and others, you know, hers is working perfectly. Lauren's mic can be heard audibly. So in, I think we need to put some, especially during the pandemic, and we can use ARPA funds for it, we need to immediately put some money towards improving the interaction. A screen on the back of this pole so that it can be, what's seen here cannot be seen from back there. So. There's, there's some minor improvements, uh, feedback electronics, feedback canceling electronics. These are things that ORCA can pull a technician in and a designer and improve this council chamber for this and make it useful for other entities like CDPSA when they meet here. Uh, so I'm just suggesting that it's not, it's not good to compromise these very important and time sensitive discussions with uh, who can, uh, who, who can get noticed or voice only is even worse, uh, which is what I'm limited to. Okay, over thank, the telephone. thanks, Steve. Uh, Vicki. There. Um, yes, I, I would like to reiterate what Jack said. Um, I think it's really important, and I think that that's where I'm hearing that you're going is that at least next week's meeting, because next week is the final budget public hearing, correct? Yes. Um, is held in the city council chambers because there are people who can't, uh, can't access um, the Zoom stuff. Um, so anyway, um, unless all hell breaks loose in this coming week, which we hope doesn't, um, I, I think that's good. I agree with Jack. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll move on to, uh, we'll discuss that, tape that up again. Next, um, that uh, brings us to number 17, other business. Do we have any other business? Um, number 18, then uh, council reports. How will we start with Lauren this time? <laughs> my mind is blown wow i know usually i rotate. snap for a few minutes no. take turn, alternate but so yeah so great okay um all that i have is um we'll, we'll have more time for it but grateful to uh, to jay for his service and he'll be missed and we'll we can do more of that, but what if we're in zoom <laughs> so just thank you jay and really grateful that uh my other colleagues are um, stepping up for re-election. This is very hard work and uh, putting yourself out there. I really appreciate working with all of you. So grateful for that. Um, 
And then the only other thing, and I don't know if somebody else is better positioned to talk about it, but um, Connor, Jack, and Bill and I were able to have a conversation about getting um, a basically request out to some of the Montpelier based lobbying firms to try to line someone up so they can be representing Montpelier's interests in the state house, particularly with all of the federal dollars flowing and some big needs that we have and a big um, legislative agenda. So um, we had come up with a process. I don't know, Bill, if you want to describe it briefly, but just wanted to make sure that everyone was good with where we had landed. So you recall the the council had put in um, money for next year, but also had talked about needing to do something for this current session. So the lobbying committee and I met and simply said, how, how you know, let's see if the council's on board, we've got a draft. It's not really an RFP, it's just give us a letter of interest and with some basic questions in it. We've got a list of all the Montpelier lobbying firms. So it's all, it's all drafted. We've got the list, it's ready to go. We would issue it tonight or tomorrow morning and asked them to get it to us in time for next week's meeting to, you know, by Wednesday, so we can maybe, I don't know, have a recommendation for Thursday night and choose somebody and get going. Um, you know, and obviously if, if it's more complicated, we'll have to wait until the February meeting, but then the session's almost half over. So we wanted to move then, but we figured we'd at least see if people were on board with that process, uh, committing anything yet until we actually make an agreement with somebody. And did that go to the, all the members of the council? It hasn't yet because, oh, okay. because we want this. Mm -hmm. Looks good to me. Great. Great. I think that's it for me. Thanks. I don't have anything, but Jay, I just wanted to say appreciate your help in my entry to this world of District 3 on the City Council, and I'm going to miss uh, our emails. Um, and I don't have anything else. I've had some constituents email me with some concerns about the structure over in the empty lot where the, what is that place? It was the Girton Park. Park, thank you. Um, and so I would like to talk about that at some point moving forward. Okay. Jay? I guess the cat's out of the bag, huh? I'll have more to say to this later, to this later but by obviously by a process of elimination and not stepping to the mic earlier tonight, um, uh, I'm not planning on running for re-election. Um, uh, I'll I'll leave it at that. I will have plenty more to say. I did send a note to to folks who have been really supportive of of me and my time here these last couple of years, and uh, I'm really appreciative of of the work we've done. But I'll just leave it at that for now. Yeah. Thanks. I'm actually quite angry at Jay, so uh, I'm going to save the tribute for another time there, but there'll be plenty of time to uh, sing his praises in the future when the burning rage dies down. Um, <laughs> uh, just a couple of things. Uh, Lauren brought it up today. I, I, I think it would be uh, kind of we could just have a discussion of how we can welcome our new uh, Afghani neighbors here. It was great to see so many of them um, up at the Sledding Hill and Hubbard Park. Uh, this weekend it looked like, looked like they were having a great time but it'd be nice if we could have an introduction and just just put some faces to names and do a proper welcome somehow yeah. um and otherwise personal privilege i just took a new job as director of gun sense vermont working on gun violence legislation up at the state house so um, that'll put me out of the mix of any <laughs> gun stuff we discuss here but uh <laughs> we're looking, looking forward to getting into that so that's it for me thanks you never take on the easy topics. <laughs> I have nothing. Thank you all. He has three more meetings. I can harass him and thank him. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I don't have much to say other than I also appreciate, greatly appreciate the work that Jay's done and the expertise that he's brought to the council. You know, one of the things that we learn is that everyone who comes onto the council has the things that they're. Uh, <clears throat> some areas of real expertise that they uh, bring to the council and uh, we kind of hope that our our gaps and our strengths kind of uh, mesh so that we can do a good job on everything that comes uh, before us and I think that Jay has been really great to know about stuff that I don't know I don't know anything about so <laughs> 
Um, City clerk's report. Is the city clerk still awake, and does he have anything to report? <laughs> I am not nothing really to report. I'm not going to vouch for being awake, but um, yeah. So I'm going to be away, just so you all know, for a couple days. Um, it was a pretty okay. So my tattoo artist yesterday, after a two-hour <laughs> appointment, you know, close contact with masks, is now incredibly sick. So yeah i'm probably not so good but there was no exposure in the office just a brief exposure well before i would have been uh uh contagious so i just want to since i mentioned that i want to make sure everybody feels completely comfortable going into the office it's all good i'll do as much work and be as responsive as i can to members of the public from home and um but yeah come on in it's all good <laughs> Oh, you know, it just occurred to me before I pass this over to Bill that uh, I actually do have one other thing I want to mention. We don't, I try not to mix the uh, party politics with the uh, city business, but uh, we're uh, the Democratic uh, Committee for Montpelier is collecting uh, winter clothes for homeless veterans, and I'm collecting clothes up until this weekend at my house. So if you have something, um, feel free to reach out to me and uh, fill up my kitchen even more than it's already full. Yeah. Bill. Thank you. Um, just a couple things. Reminder to uh, all of the folks that just announced that they are running for re-election and also anybody out there who is interested in running for election that the petition, uh, your deadline to get your petitions in is next Thursday and any other petitions that are coming. And uh, so be aware of that. We covered the uh, uh, Just a quick correction there. Petitions sorry. for running are due the 24th. I am sorry. Thank you, Mr. City Clerk. I thought they were all due the same day. Nope. No. OK, so petitions for running are due the 24th. Thank you. But any If there are petitions for items to be considered on the ballot, those are due by next Thursday. Um, I think that's the only real announcement I have. I just wanted to offer a couple comments on, um, you know, several people mentioned communications tonight, and I certainly agree with that, that, you know, public communications is really important in the ability for people to participate. And, uh, uh, you know, we don't have to debate it now, although it might be good to have for future conversation. Uh, we're, we're certainly open to any suggestions that people have and are interested in people's ideas. I, I, I don't, you know, we, we don't have to have these two public hearings, and we do, and we actually had people engaging in a public conversation. So it, I find it interesting when people are in a public conversation saying we ought to have a public conversation. I mean, this is the public conversation. And um, we have had for many years, uh, we held a, a pre-budget meeting. Uh, we would have all the school staff, all the city staff uh, at the senior center opened it up, advertised it, did things, and, you know, five to eight people would come. And so, I, I, you know, we want to be effective in our public communications. We want to hold this, and, and, you know, perhaps remote is now the way to go. We could hold a you know, public hearing. We will be having a public information hearing on the budget and the bonds the, the, in the last meeting in February before the vote so that people can get information. We, we're right in the, in the bridge article in great detail, the annual you know, report has a lot of detail. Uh, we post on Front Porch Forum and those places pointing people to these hearings to come. I'm not trying to be defensive. I'm saying that we are, you know, uh, we're trying to do outreach. We, you know, I, we recognize the, the flaws with the, um, with the website and we're hoping to correct them. And, but we still try to post these things. So additional ideas for how we can do outreach that are actually going to be effective and get to people and that people will participate um, are welcome because we would we would love to have more more participation in, in the process and, and uh, to provide information and things like the budget, you know, it, it's a lot. It's it's a lot of information and it is a weighty budget book. And um, you know, there was a time when we would go line by line through the budget. And um, and people complained that we're in attendance, that it was boring and they didn't get anything out of it. So you know, I, I don't know what the right answer is. It seems like whatever we do isn't uh, 
sufficient, but we want it to be sufficient. And I know public communication is a high goal of the, the, the city councils and of the community and of our staff. So anyone with suggestions, please share them. Thanks. On to item number 16, discussion of real estate negotiations. Um, the chair would entertain two motions. Um, really testing me tonight. Okay. <laughs> All right. I move that we enter executive session. Oh. No. Is that first, that's the first, first one's the other one? That's the second okay. one. Yeah. <laughs> the first is the second one. Okay. I move to find the premature uh, general public knowledge of the real estate matter. Is that what will clearly place the city at a substantial disadvantage by disclosing our intentions. Our intentions. Yeah. Is there a second? second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, I move that we enter executive session to discuss a real estate matter under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A1. Uh, two. Oh. A2. A2 um, of the Vermont statutes. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And uh, the executive session should include the city manager, anyone else? Okay. Okay. Um, we don't expect to, but we will come, we will reconvene and come out after executive session. Okay, we're going into executive session. Executive session? We have a motion. <laughs> I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Jay? Um, and I'd like to make a motion that we authorize the city manager to proceed with um, the uh, uh, purchase process of the um, what do we, what do we yeah purchase process of the country club property um, based on the parameters we discussed in the executive session. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And hearing no objection, we will be in adjournment at 10.34 p.m. Thank you.